This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 18 A War Wedding. I can tell you this, Doctor dear, said Susan, pale with wrath, that Germany is getting to be perfectly ridiculous. They were all in the big Ingleside kitchen. Susan was mixing biscuits for supper, Mrs. Blythe was making shortbread for Jem, and Rilla was compounding candy for Ken and Walter. It had once been Walter and Ken in her thoughts, but somehow, quite unconsciously, this had changed until Ken's name came naturally first. Cousin Sophia was also there knitting. All the boys were going to be killed in the long run, so Cousin Sophia felt in her bones, but they might better die with warm feet than cold ones, so Cousin Sophia knitted faithfully and gloomily. Into this peaceful scene erupted the doctor, wrathful and excited over the burning of the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, and Susan became automatically quite as wrathful and excited. "'What will those Huns do next?' she demanded. "'Coming over here and burning our Parliament building. Did anyone ever hear of such an outrage?' "'We don't know that the Germans are responsible for this,' said the doctor, much as if he felt quite sure they were. "'Fires do start without their agency sometimes. And Uncle Mark McAllister's barn was burnt last week. You can hardly accuse the Germans of that, Susan.' "'Indeed, Dr. dear, I do not know.' Susan nodded slowly and portentously. "'Whiskers on the moon was there that very day. The fire broke out half an hour after he was gone. So much is a fact. But I shall not accuse a Presbyterian elder of burning anybody's barn until I have proof.' However, everybody knows, Dr. dear, that both Uncle Mark's boys have enlisted, and that Uncle Mark himself makes speeches at all the recruiting meetings. So no doubt Germany is anxious to get square with him." "'I could never speak at a recruiting meeting,' said Cousin Sophia solemnly. "'I could never reconcile it to my conscience to ask another woman's son to go, to murder and be murdered.' "'Could you not?' said Susan. Well, Sophia Crawford, I felt as if I could ask anyone to go when I read last night that there were no children under eight years of age left alive in Poland. Think of that, Sophia Crawford. Susan shook a flowery finger at Sophia. Not one child under eight years of age. I suppose the Germans has et em all, sighed Cousin Sophia. Well, no, said Susan reluctantly, as if she hated to admit that there was any crime the Huns couldn't be accused of. The Germans have not turned cannibal yet, as far as I know. They have died of starvation and exposure, the poor little creatures. There is murdering for you, Cousin Sophia Crawford. The thought of it poisons every bite and sup I take. I see that Fred Carson of Lowbridge has been awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal, remarked the doctor over his local paper. I heard that last week, said Susan. He is a battalion runner, and he did something extra brave and daring. His letter telling his folks about it came when his old grandmother Carson was on her dying bed. She had only a few minutes more to live, and the Episcopal minister, who was there, asked her if she would not like him to pray. "'Oh, yes, yes, you can pray,' she said impatient-like. She was a dean, Dr. dear, and the deans were always high-spirited. "'You can pray, but for pity's sake, pray low and don't disturb me. I want to think over this splendid news, and I have not much time left to do it.' That was Elmira Carson all over. Fred was the apple of her eye. She was seventy-five years of age, and had not a gray hair in her head, they tell me. "'By the way, that reminds me. I found a gray hair this morning. My very first, said Mrs. Blythe. "'I have noticed that gray hair for some time, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I did not speak of it. Thought I to myself, she has enough to bear. But now that you have discovered it, let me remind you that gray hairs are honorable.' "'I must be getting old, Gilbert,' Mrs. Blythe laughed a trifle ruefully. "'People are beginning to tell me I look so young. They never tell you that when you are young.' but I shall not worry over my silver thread. I never liked red hair. Gilbert, did I ever tell you of that time, years ago at Green Gables, when I dyed my hair? Nobody but Marilla and I knew about it. Was that the reason you came out once with your hair shingled to the bone? <laughs> yes. I bought a bottle of dye from a German Jew peddler. I fondly expected it would turn my hair black, and it turned it green, so it had to be cut off. "'You had a narrow escape, Mrs. Dr. dear,' exclaimed Susan. "'Of course you were too young then to know what a German was. It was a special mercy of Providence that it was only green dye and not poison.' "'It seems hundreds of years since those green gables days,' sighed Mrs. Blythe. "'They belong to another world altogether. Life has been cut in two by the chasm of war. What is ahead, I don't know. But it can't be a bit like the past. I wonder if those of us who have lived half our lives in the old world will ever feel wholly at home in the new.' "'Have you noticed,' asked Miss Oliver, glancing up from her book, "'how everything written before the war seems so far away now, too? 
One feels as if one was reading something as ancient as the Iliad. This poem of Wordsworth's, the senior class have it in their entrance work. I've been glancing over it. Its classic calm and repose and the beauty of the lines seem to belong to another planet, and to have as little to do with the present world welter as the evening star. The only thing I find much comfort in reading nowadays is the Bible, remarked Susan, whisking her biscuits into the oven. There are so many passages in it that seem to me exactly descriptive of the Huns. Old Highland Sandy declares that there is no doubt that the Kaiser is the Antichrist spoken of in Revelations, but I do not go as far as that. It would, in my humble opinion, Mrs. Dr. dear, be too great an honour for him. Early one morning, several days later, Miranda Pryor slipped up to Ingleside, ostensibly to get some Red Cross sewing, but in reality to talk over with sympathetic Rilla troubles that were past bearing alone. She brought her dog with her, an overfed, bandy-legged little animal, very dear to her heart, because Joe Milgrave had given it to her when it was a puppy. Mr. Pryor regarded all dogs with disfavour, but in those days he had looked kindly upon Joe as a suitor for Miranda's hand, and so he had allowed her to keep the puppy. Miranda was so grateful that she endeavoured to please her father by naming her dog after his political idol, the great liberal chieftain Sir Wilfrid Laurier, though his title was soon abbreviated to Wilfy. Sir Wilfrid grew and flourished and waxed fat but Miranda spoiled him absurdly, and nobody else liked him. Rilla especially hated him because of his detestable trick of lying flat on his back and entreating you with waving paws to tickle his sleek stomach. When she saw that Miranda's pale eyes bore unmistakable testimony of her having cried all night, Rilla asked her to come up to her room, knowing Miranda had a tale of woe to tell. But she ordered Sir Wilfrid to remain below. "'Oh, can't he come too?' said Miranda wistfully. "'Poor Wilfie won't be any bother, and I wiped his paws so carefully before I brought him in.' He's always so lonesome in a strange place without me, and very soon he'll be all I'll have left to remind me of Joe." Rilla yielded, and Sir Wilfrid, with his tail curled at a saucy angle over his brindled back, trotted triumphantly up the stairs before them. "'Oh, Rilla!' sobbed Miranda when they had reached Sanctuary. "'I'm so unhappy. I can't begin to tell you how unhappy I am. Truly, my heart is breaking. Rilla sat down on the lounge beside her. Sir Wilfrid squatted on his haunches before them, with his impertinent pink tongue stuck out, and listened. "'What is the trouble, Miranda?' "'Joe is coming home tonight on his last leave. I had a letter from him on Saturday. He sends my letters in care of Bob Crawford, you know, because of father. And, oh, Rilla, he will only have four days. He has to go away Friday morning, and I may never see him again.' "'Does he still want you to marry him?' asked Rilla. "'Oh, yes. He implored me in his letter to run away and be married. But I cannot do that, Rilla, not even for Joe. My only comfort is that I will be able to see him for a little while tomorrow afternoon. Father has to go to Charlottetown on business. At least we will have one good farewell talk. But, oh, afterwards! Why, Rilla, I know Father won't even let me go to the station Friday morning to see Joe off. Why in the world don't you and Joe get married tomorrow afternoon at home?' demanded Rilla. Miranda swallowed a sob in such amazement that she almost choked. "'Why, why, that is impossible, Rilla!' "'Why?' briefly demanded the organizer of the Junior Red Cross, and the transporter of babies in soup tureens. "'Why, why, we never thought of such a thing. Joe hasn't a license. I, ha I have no dress. I couldn't be married in black. I—I—we—you—you—' I, we, you, you. Miranda lost herself altogether, and Sir Wilfrid, seeing that she was in dire distress, threw back his head and emitted a melancholy yelp. Rilla Blythe thought hard and rapidly for a few minutes. Then she said, "'Miranda, if you will put yourself into my hands, I'll have you married to Joe before four o'clock tomorrow afternoon.' "'Oh, you couldn't!' "'I can and I will. But you'll have to do exactly as I tell you.' "'Oh, I don't think—oh, father will kill me!' "'Nonsense. He'll be very angry, I suppose. But are you more afraid of your father's anger than you are of Joe's never coming back to you?' "'No,' said Miranda, with sudden firmness. "'I'm not.' "'Will you do as I tell you, then?' "'Yes, I will. "'Then get Joe on the long distance at once, "'and tell him to bring out a license and ring tonight. "'Oh, I couldn't!' wailed the aghast Miranda. "'It, it would be so—so so indelicate!' "'Rilla shut her little white teeth together with a snap. "'Heaven grant me patience,' she said under her breath. "'I'll do it, then,' she said aloud. "'And meanwhile, you go home and make what preparations you can. "'When I phone down to you to come up and help me so, come at once.' 
As soon as Miranda, pallid, scared, but desperately resolved, had gone, Rilla flew to the telephone and put in a long-distance call for Charlottetown. She got through with such surprising quickness that she was convinced Providence approved of her undertaking, but it was a good hour before she could get in touch with Joe Milgrave at his camp. Meanwhile she paced impatiently about, and prayed that when she did get Joe there would be no listeners on the line to carry news to Whiskers on the Moon. "'Is that you, Joe? Rilla Blythe is speaking. Rilla! Rilla! Oh, never mind. Listen to this. Before you come home tonight, get a marriage license. A marriage license. Yes, a marriage license. And a wedding ring. Did you get that? And will you do it? Very well. Be sure you do it. It is your only chance. Flushed with triumph, for her only fear was that she might not be able to locate Joe in time, Rilla rang the prior ring. This time she had not such good luck, for she drew whiskers on the moon. Is that Miranda? Oh, M Mr. Pryor. Well, Mr. Pryor, will you kindly ask Miranda if she can come up this afternoon and help me with some sewing? It is very important, or I would not trouble her. Oh, thank you. Mr. Pryor had consented somewhat grumpily, but he had consented. He did not want to offend Dr. Blythe, and he knew that if he refused to allow Miranda to do any Red Cross work, public opinion would make the Glen too hot for comfort. Rilla went out to the kitchen, shut all the doors with a mysterious expression which alarmed Susan, and then said solemnly, "'Susan, can you make a wedding cake this afternoon?' "'A wedding cake?' Susan stared. Rilla had, without any warning, brought her a war-baby once upon a time. Was she now, with equal suddenness, going to produce a husband? Yes, a wedding cake, a scrumptious wedding cake, Susan, a beautiful, plummy, eggy, citron-peely wedding cake. And we must make other things, too. I'll help you in the morning, but I can't help you in the afternoon, for I have to make a wedding dress, and time is the essence of the contract, Susan. Susan felt that she was really too old to be subjected to such shocks. "'Who are you going to marry, Rilla?' she asked feebly. "'Susan, darling, I am not the happy bride. Miranda Pryor is going to marry Joe Milgrave tomorrow afternoon while her father is away in town. A war wedding, Susan. Isn't that thrilling and romantic? I never was so excited in my life.' The excitement soon spread over Ingleside, infecting even Mrs. Blythe and Susan. "'I'll go to work on that cake at once,' vowed Susan, with a glance at the clock. "'Mrs. Doctor, dear, will you pick over the fruit and beat up the eggs? If you will, I can have that cake ready for the oven by the evening.' Tomorrow morning we can make salads and other things. I will work all night, if necessary, to get the better of whiskers on the moon. Miranda arrived, tearful and breathless. We must fix over my white dress for you to wear, said Rilla. It will fit you very nicely with a little alteration. To work went the two girls, ripping, fitting, basting, sewing for dear life. By dint of unceasing effort they got the dress done by seven o'clock, and Miranda tried it on in Rilla's room. It's very pretty, but, oh, if I could just have a veil, sighed Miranda. I've always dreamed of being married in a lovely white veil. Some good fairy evidently waits on the wishes of war brides. The door opened, and Mrs. Blythe came in, her arms full of a filmy burden. Miranda, dear, she said, I want you to wear my wedding veil tomorrow. It is twenty-four years since I was a bride at Old Green Gables, the happiest bride that ever was. And the wedding veil of a happy bride brings good luck, they say. Oh, how sweet of you, Mrs. Blythe, said Miranda, the ready tears starting to her eyes. The veil was tried on and draped. Susan dropped in to approve, but dared not linger. "'I've got that cake in the oven,' she said, "'and I am pursuing a policy of watchful waiting. The evening news is that the Grand Duke has captured Erzurum. That is a pill for the Turks. I wish I had a chance to tell the Tsar just what a mistake he made when he turned Nicholas down.' Susan disappeared downstairs to the kitchen, whence a terrible thud and piercing shriek presently sounded. Everybody rushed to the kitchen—the doctor and Miss Oliver, Mrs. Blythe, Rilla, Miranda, and her wedding veil. Susan was sitting flatly in the middle of the kitchen floor with a dazed, bewildered look on her face, while Doc, evidently in his hide incarnation, was standing on the dresser, with his back up, his eyes blazing, and his tail the size of three tails. "'Susan, what has happened?' cried Mrs. Blythe in alarm. "'Did you fall? Are you hurt?' Susan picked herself up. "'No,' she said grimly. "'I am not hurt, though I am jarred all over. Do not be alarmed. As for what happened, I tried to kick that darn cat with both feet. That's what happened.' Everybody shrieked with laughter. The doctor was quite helpless. "'Oh, Susan, Susan!' he gasped. "'That I should live to hear you swear!' "'I am sorry,' said Susan, in real distress, "'that I used such an expression before two young girls. "'But I said that beast was darned, and darned it is. "'It belongs to old Nick.' "'Do you expect it will vanish some of these days "'with a bang in the odour of brimstone, Susan? "'It will go to its own place in due time, "'and that you may tie to.' said Susan, dourly, shaking out her rattled bones and going to her oven. 
I suppose my plunking down like that has shaken my cake so that it will be as heavy as lead. But the cake was not heavy. It was all a bride's cake should be, and Susan iced it beautifully. Next day she and Rilla worked all the forenoon, making delicacies for the wedding feast, and as soon as Miranda phoned up that her father was safely off, everything was packed in a big hamper and taken down to the prior house. Joe soon arrived in his uniform, in a state of violent excitement, accompanied by his best man, Sergeant Malcolm Crawford. There were quite a few guests, for all the manse and Ingleside folk were there, and a dozen or so of Joe's relatives, including his mother, Mrs. Dead Angus Milgrave, so called, cheerfully, to distinguish her from another lady whose Angus was living. Mrs. Dead Angus wore a rather disapproving expression, not caring over much for this alliance with the house of Whiskers on the Moon. So Miranda Pryor was married to Private Joseph Milgrave, on his last leave. It should have been a romantic wedding, but it was not. There were too many factors working against romance, as even Rilla had to admit. In the first place Miranda, in spite of her dress and veil, was such a flat-faced, commonplace, uninteresting little bride. In the second place Joe cried bitterly all through the ceremony, and this vexed Miranda unreasonably. Long afterwards she told Rilla, "'I just felt like saying to him then and there, "'If you feel so bad over having to marry me, you don't have to.' But it was just because he was thinking all the time of how soon he would have to leave me. In the third place, Jims, who was usually so well behaved in public, took a fit of shyness and contrariness combined, and began to cry at the top of his voice for Willa. Nobody wanted to take him out, because everybody wanted to see the marriage, so Rilla, who was a bridesmaid, had to take him and hold him during the ceremony. In the fourth place, Sir Wilfrid Laurier took a fit. Sir Wilfrid was entrenched in a corner of the room behind Miranda's piano. During his seizure he made the weirdest, most unearthly noises. He would begin with a series of choking, spasmodic sounds, continuing into a gruesome gurgle, and ending up with a strangled howl. Nobody could hear a word Mr. Meredith was saying, except now and then, when Sir Wilfrid stopped for breath. Nobody looked at the bride except Susan, who never dragged her fascinated eyes from Miranda's face. All the others were gazing at the dog. Miranda had been trembling with nervousness, but as soon as Sir Wilfrid began his performance she forgot it. All that she could think of was that her dear dog was dying and she could not go to him. She never remembered a word of the ceremony. Rilla, who in spite of Jim's had been trying her best to look rapt and romantic as beseemed a war bridesmaid, gave up the hopeless attempt and devoted her energies to choking down untimely merriment. She dared not look at anybody in the room, especially Mrs. Dead Angus, for fear all her suppressed mirth should suddenly explode in a most unyoung ladylike yell of laughter. But married they were, and then they had a wedding supper in the dining room, which was so lavish and bountiful that you would have thought it was the product of a month's labour. Everybody had brought something. Mrs. Dead Angus had brought a large apple pie, which she placed on a chair in the dining room and then absently sat down on it. Neither her temper nor her black silk wedding garment was improved thereby, but the pie was never missed at the gay bridal feast. Mrs. Dead Angus eventually took it home with her again. Whiskers on the Moon's pacifist pig should not get it anyhow. That evening Mr. and Mrs. Joe, accompanied by the recovered Sir Wilfrid, departed for the Four Winds Lighthouse, which was kept by Joe's uncle, and in which they meant to spend their brief honeymoon. Una Meredith and Rilla and Susan washed the dishes, tidied up, left a cold supper and Miranda's pitiful little note on the table for Mr. Pryor, and walked home, while the mystic veil of dreamy, haunted winter twilight wrapped itself over the glen. "'I would really not have minded being a war bride myself,' remarked Susan sentimentally. But Rilla felt rather flat perhaps as a reaction to all the excitement and the rush of the past thirty-six hours. She was disappointed somehow. The whole affair had been so ludicrous, and Miranda and Joe so lachrymose and commonplace. "'If Miranda hadn't given that wretched dog such an enormous dinner, he wouldn't have had that fit,' she said crossly. "'I warned her, but she said she couldn't starve the poor dog. He would soon be all she had left, etc. I could have shaken her.' "'The best man was more excited than Joe was,' said Susan. He wished Miranda many happy returns of the day. She did not look very happy, but perhaps you could not expect that under the circumstances. Anyhow, thought Rilla, I can write a perfectly killing account of it to all the boys. How Jem will howl over Sir Wilfrid's part in it. But if Rilla was rather disappointed in the war wedding, she found nothing lacking on Friday morning when Miranda said good-bye to her bridegroom at the Glen Station. The dawn was white as a pearl, clear as a diamond. Behind the station the balsamy copse of young firs was frost-misted. The cold moon of dawn hung over the westering snowfields, but the golden fleeces of sunrise shone above the maples up at Ingleside. Joe took his pale little bride in his arms, and she lifted her face to his. Rilla choked suddenly. It did not matter that Miranda was insignificant and commonplace and flat-featured. It did not matter that she was the daughter of Whiskers-on-the-Moon. 
All that matters was that rapt, sacrificial look in her eyes, that ever-burning, sacred fire of devotion and loyalty and fine courage that she was mutely promising Joe she and thousands of other women would keep alive at home while their men held the western front. Rilla walked away, realizing that she must not spy on such a moment. She went down to the end of the platform where Sir Wilfrid and Dog Monday were sitting, looking at each other. Sir Wilfrid remarked condescendingly, "'Why do you haunt this old shed when you might lie on the hearthrug at Ingleside and live on the fat of the land? Is it a pose, or a fixed idea?' Whereat Dog Monday, laconically, "'I have a tryst to keep.' When the train had gone, Rilla rejoined the little trembling Miranda. "'Well, he's gone,' said Miranda, "'and he may never come back. But I'm his wife, and I'm going to be worthy of him. I'm going home.' "'Don't you think you had better come with me now?' asked Rilla doubtfully. Nobody knew yet how Mr. Pryor had taken the matter. No. If Joe can face the Huns, I guess I can face father, said Miranda daringly. A soldier's wife can't be a coward. Come on, Wilfie. I'll go straight home and meet the worst. There was nothing very dreadful to face, however. Perhaps Mr. Pryor had reflected that housekeepers were hard to get, and that there were many Milgrave homes open to Miranda. Also, that there was such a thing as a separation allowance. At all events, though he told her grumpily that she had made a nice fool of herself and would live to regret it, he said nothing worse, and Mrs. Joe put on her apron and went to work as usual, while Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who had a poor opinion of lighthouses for winter residences, went to sleep in his pet nook behind the wood-box, a thankful dog that he was done with war-weddings. End of chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 19. They Shall Not Pass. One cold gray morning in February, Gertrude Oliver, wakened with a shiver, slipped into Rilla's room and crept in beside her. Rilla, I'm frightened. Frightened as a baby. I've had another of my strange dreams. "'Something terrible is before us, I know.' "'What is it?' asked Rilla. "'I was standing again on the veranda steps, "'just as I stood in that dream on the night before the lighthouse dance, "'and in the sky a huge, black, menacing thunder-cloud rolled up from the east. "'I could see its shadow racing before it, "'and when it enveloped me I shivered with icy cold. "'Then the storm broke, and it was a dreadful storm— blinding flash after flash and a deafening peal after peal, driving torrents of rain. I turned in panic and tried to run for shelter, and as I did so a man, a soldier in the uniform of a French army officer, dashed up the steps and stood beside me on the threshold of the door. His clothes were soaked with blood from a wound in his breast. He seemed spent and exhausted, but his white face was set and his eyes blazed in his hollow face. They shall not pass." he said in low, passionate tones which I heard distinctly amid all the turmoil of the storm. Then I awakened. Rilla, I'm frightened. The spring will not bring the big push we've all been hoping for. Instead, it is going to bring some dreadful blow to France, I am sure of it. The Germans will try to smash through somewhere. But he told you they would not pass, said Rilla seriously. She never laughed at Gertrude's dreams as the doctor did. I do not know if that was prophecy or desperation, Rilla. The horror of that dream holds me yet in an icy grip. We shall need all our courage before long. Dr. Blythe did laugh at the breakfast table. But he never laughed at Miss Oliver's dreams again, for that day brought news of the opening of the Verdun offensive. And thereafter, through all the beautiful weeks of spring, the Ingleside family, one and all, lived in a trance of dread. There were days when they waited in despair for the end, as foot by foot the Germans crept nearer and nearer to the grim barrier of desperate France. Susan's deeds were in her spotless kitchen at Ingleside, but her thoughts were on the hills around Verdun. "'Mrs. Doctor, dear,' she would stick her head in at Mrs. Blythe's door the last thing at night to remark, "'I do hope the French have hung on to the crowswood to-day.' And she woke at dawn to wonder if Dead Man's Hill, surely named by some prophet, was still held by the Poilus. Susan could have drawn a map of the country around Verdun that would have satisfied a chief of staff. "'If the Germans capture Verdun, the spirit of France will be broken,' Miss Oliver said bitterly. "'But they will not capture it,' staunchly said Susan, who could not eat her dinner that day for fear lest they do that very thing. "'In the first place you dreamed they would not. You dreamed the very thing the French are saying before they ever said it. They shall not pass. I declare to you, Miss Oliver, dear, when I read that in the paper and remembered your dream—' 
I went cold all over with awe. It seemed to me like biblical times when people dream things like that quite frequently. I know, I know, said Gertrude, walking restlessly about. I cling to a persistent faith in my dream, too, but every time bad news comes it fails me. Then I tell myself mere coincidence, subconscious memory, and so forth. I do not see how any memory could remember a thing before it was ever said at all, persisted Susan, though of course I am not educated like you and the doctor. I would rather not be, if it makes anything as simple as that so hard to believe. But in any case, we need not worry over Verdun, even if the Huns get it. Joffre says it has no military significance. That old sop of comfort has been served up too often already when reverses came, retorted Gertrude. It has lost its power to charm. Was there ever a battle like this in the world before? said Mr. Meredith one evening in mid April. It's such a titanic thing we can't grasp it, said the doctor. What were the scraps of a few Homeric handfuls compared to this? The whole Trojan War might be fought around a Verdun fort, and a newspaper correspondent would give it no more than a sentence. I am not in the confidence of the occult powers. The doctor threw at Gertrude a twinkle. But I have a hunch that the fate of the whole war hangs on the issue of Verdun. As Susan and Joffre say, it has no real military significance, but it has the tremendous significance of an idea. If Germany wins there, she will win the war. If she loses, the tide will set against her. Lose she will, said Mr. Meredith emphatically. The idea cannot be conquered. France is certainly very wonderful. It seems to me that in her I see the white form of civilization making a determined stand against the black powers of barbarism. I think our whole world realizes this, and that is why we all await the issue so breathlessly. It isn't merely the question of a few forts changing hands or a few miles of blood soaked ground lost and won. I wonder, said Gertrude dreamily, if some great blessing, great enough for the price, will be the meat of all our pain. Is the agony in which the world is shuddering the birth pang of some wondrous new era? Or is it merely a futile struggle of ants in the gleam of a million million of suns? We think very lightly, Mr. Meredith, of a calamity which destroys an ant hill and half its inhabitants. Does the power that runs the universe think us of more importance than we think ants? You forget. Said Mr. Meredith, with a flash of his dark eyes, that an infinite power must be infinitely little as well as infinitely great. We are neither. Therefore, there are things too little as well as too great for us to apprehend. To the infinitely little, an ant is of as much importance as a mastodon. We are witnessing the birth pangs of a new era, but it will be born a feeble, wailing life like everything else. I am not one of those who expect a new heaven and a new earth as the immediate result of this war. That is not the way God works. But work he does, Miss Oliver, and in the end his purpose will be fulfilled. Sound and orthodox, sound and orthodox, muttered Susan approvingly in the kitchen. Susan liked to see Miss Oliver sat upon by the minister now and then. Susan was very fond of her, but she thought Miss Oliver liked saying heretical things to ministers far too well, and deserved an occasional reminder that these matters were quite beyond her province. In May, Walter wrote home that he had been awarded a D.C. medal. He did not say what for, but the other boys took care that the Glen should know the brave thing Walter had done. In any war but this, wrote Jerry Meredith, it would have meant a V.C., but they can't make V.C.s as common as the brave things done every day here. He should have had the V.C., said Susan, and was very indignant over it. She was not quite sure who was to blame for his not getting it, but if it were General Haig, she began for the first time to entertain serious doubts as to his fitness for being commander in chief. Rilla was beside herself with delight. It was her dear Walter who had done this thing. Walter, to whom someone had sent a white feather at Redmond. It was Walter who had dashed back from the safety of the trench to drag in a wounded comrade who had fallen on no man's land. Oh, she could see his white, beautiful face and wonderful eyes as he did it. What a thing to be the sister of such a hero! And he hadn't thought it worth while writing about. His letter was full of other things, little intimate things that they two had known and loved together in the dear old cloudless days of a century ago. I've been thinking of the daffodils in the garden at Ingleside, he wrote. By the time you get this, they will be out, blowing there under that lovely rosy sky. Are they really as bright and golden as ever, Rilla? It seems to me that they must be dyed red with blood, like our poppies here. And every whisper of spring will be falling as a violet in Rainbow Valley. There is a young moon tonight, a slender, silver, lovely thing hanging over these pits of torment. Will you see it tonight over the maple grove? I'm enclosing a little scrap of verse, Rilla. 
I wrote it one evening in my trench dugout by the light of a bit of candle. Or rather, it came to me there. I didn't feel as if I were writing it. Something seemed to use me as an instrument. I've had that feeling once or twice before, but very rarely, and never so strongly as this time. That was why I sent it over to the London Spectator. It printed it, and the copy came today. I hope you'll like it. It's the only poem I've written since I came overseas. The poem was a short, poignant little thing. In a month it had carried Walter's name to every corner of the globe. Everywhere it was copied, in metropolitan dailies and little village weeklies, in profound reviews and agony columns, in Red Cross appeals and government recruiting propaganda. Mothers and sisters wept over it, young lads thrilled to it. The whole great heart of humanity caught it up as an epitome of all the pain and hope and pity and purpose of the mighty conflict, crystallized in three brief immortal verses. A Canadian lad in the Flanders trenches had written the one great poem of the war. The Piper, by Private Walter Blythe, was a classic from its first printing. Rilla copied it in her diary at the beginning of an entry in which she poured out the story of the hard week that had just passed. "'It has been such a dreadful week,' she wrote. "'And even though it is over, and we know that it was all a mistake, that does not seem to do away with the bruises left by it. And yet it has in some ways been a very wonderful week, and I have had some glimpses of things I never realized before.' of how fine and brave people can be even in the midst of horrible suffering. I am sure I could never be as splendid as Miss Oliver was. Just a week ago she had a letter from Mr. Grant's mother in Charlottetown, and it told her that a cable had just come saying that Major Robert Grant had been killed in action a few days before. Oh, poor Gertrude! At first she was crushed. Then after just a day she pulled herself together and went back to her school. She did not cry. I never saw her shed a tear. But, oh, her face and eyes! I must go on with my work, she said. That is my duty just now. I could never have risen to such a height. She never spoke bitterly except once, when Susan said something about spring being here at last, and Gertrude said, Can the spring really come this year? Then she laughed. Such a dreadful little laugh, just as one might laugh in the face of death, I think, and said, Observe my egotism. Because I, Gertrude Oliver, have lost a friend, it is incredible that the spring can come as usual. The spring does not fail because of the million agonies of others, but for mine. Oh, can the universe go on? Don't feel bitter with yourself, dear, Mother said gently. It is a very natural thing to feel as if things couldn't go on just the same when some great blow has changed the world for us. We all feel like that. Then that horrid old cousin Sophia of Susan's piped up. She was sitting there knitting and croaking like an old raven of bode and woe, as Walter used to call her. "'You ain't as bad off as some, Miss Oliver,' she said, "'and you shouldn't take it so hard. There's some as has lost their husbands. That's a hard blow. And there's some as has lost their sons. You haven't lost either husband or son.' "'No,' said Gertrude, more bitterly still. "'It's true I haven't lost a husband. I have only lost the man who would have been my husband. I have lost no son.' only the sons and daughters who might have been born to me, who will never be born to me now. "'It isn't ladylike to talk like that,' said Cousin Sophia in a shocked tone. And then Gertrude laughed right out, so wildly that Cousin Sophia was really frightened. And when poor tortured Gertrude, unable to endure it any longer, hurried out of the room, Cousin Sophia asked Mother if the blow hadn't affected Miss Oliver's mind. "'I suffered the loss of two good, kind partners,' she said, "'but it did not affect me like that.' I should think it wouldn't. Those poor men must have been thankful to die. I heard Gertrude walking up and down her room most of the night. She walked like that every night, but never so long as that night. And once I heard her give a dreadful, sudden little cry as if she had been stabbed. I couldn't sleep for suffering with her, and I couldn't help her. I thought the night would never end. But it did. And then joy came in the morning, as the Bible says. Only it didn't come exactly in the morning, but well along in the afternoon. The telephone rang, and I answered it. It was old Mrs. Grant, speaking from Charlottetown, and her news was that it was all a mistake. Robert wasn't killed at all. He had only been slightly wounded in the arm and was safe in the hospital, out of harm's way for a time, anyhow. They hadn't learned yet how the mistake had happened, but supposed there must have been another Robert Grant. I hung up the telephone and flew to Rainbow Valley. I'm sure I did fly. I can't remember my feet ever touching the ground. I met Gertrude on her way home from school, in the glade of spruces where we used to play, and I just gasped out the news to her. 
I ought to have had more sense, of course, but I was so crazy with joy and excitement that I never stopped to think. Gertrude just dropped there among the golden young ferns as if she had been shot. The fright it gave me ought to make me sensible, in this respect at least, for the rest of my life. I thought I had killed her. I remembered that her mother had died very suddenly from heart failure when quite a young woman. It seemed years to me before I discovered that her heart was still beating. A pretty time I had. I never saw anybody faint before, and I knew there was nobody up at the house to help, because everybody else had gone to the station to meet Di and Nan coming home from Redmond. But I knew, theoretically, how people in a faint should be treated, and now I know it practically. Luckily the brook was handy, and after I had worked frantically over her for a while, Gertrude came back to life. She never said one word about my news, and I didn't dare to refer to it again. I helped her walk up through the maple grove and up to her room, and then she said, "'Rob is living,' as if the words were torn out of her, and flung herself on her bed and cried and cried and cried. I never saw anyone cry so before. All the tears that she hadn't shed all that week came then. She cried most of last night, I think, but her face this morning looked as if she had seen a vision of some kind, and we were all so happy that we were almost afraid. Di and Nan are home for a couple of weeks. Then they go back to Red Cross work in the training camp at Kingsport. I envy them. Father says I'm doing just as good work here with Jims and my junior Reds, but it lacks the romance theirs must have. Coot has fallen. It was almost a relief when it did fall. We had been dreading it so long. It crushed us flat for a day, and then we picked up and put it behind us. Cousin Sophia was as gloomy as usual, and came over and groaned that the British were losing everywhere. "'They're good losers,' said Susan grimly. "'When they lose a thing, they keep on looking till they find it again. Anyhow, my king and country need me now to cut potato sets for the back garden, so get you a knife and help me, Sophia Crawford. It will divert your thoughts and keep you from worrying over a campaign that you are not called upon to run.' Susan is an old brick, and the way she flattens out poor cousin Sophia is beautiful to behold. As for Verdun, that battle goes on and on, and we see-saw between hope and fear. But I know that strange dream of Miss Oliver's foretold the victory of France. They shall not pass. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 20. Norman Douglas Speaks Out in Meeting. "'Where are you wondering, Anne of mine?' asked the doctor, who even yet, after twenty-four years of marriage, occasionally addressed his wife thus when nobody was about. Anne was sitting on the veranda steps, gazing absently over the wonderful bridal world of spring blossom. Beyond the white orchard was a copse of dark young firs, and creamy wild cherries, where the robins were whistling madly, for it was evening and the fire of early stars was burning over the maple grove. Anne came back with a little sigh. "'I was just taking relief from intolerable realities in a dream, Gilbert, a dream that all our children were home again, and all small again, playing in Rainbow Valley.' It is always so silent now, but I was imagining I heard clear voices and gay childish sounds coming up as I was used to. I could hear Jem's whistle and Walter's yodel, and the twins' laughter, and for just a few blessed minutes I forgot about the guns on the western front, and had a little false sweet happiness. The doctor did not answer. Sometimes his work tricked him into forgetting for a few moments the western front, but not often. There was a good deal of grey now in his still thick curls that had not been there two years ago. Yet he smiled down into the starry eyes he loved, the eyes that had once been so full of laughter, and now seemed always full of unshed tears. Susan wandered by with a hoe in her hand and her second best bonnet on her head. I have just finished reading a piece in the Enterprise which told of a couple being married in an aeroplane. Do you think it would be legal, Dr. dear? she inquired anxiously. I think so, said the doctor gravely. "'Well,' said Susan dubiously, "'it seems to me that a wedding is too solemn for anything so giddy as an aeroplane. But nothing is the same as it used to be. Well, it is half an hour yet before prayer-meeting time, so I am going around to the kitchen garden to have a little evening hate with the weeds. But all the time I am strafing them I will be thinking about this new worry in the Trentino. I do not like this Austrian caper, Mrs. Dr. dear. "'Nor I,' said Mrs. Blythe ruefully. All the forenoon I preserved rhubarb with my hands, and waited for the war news with my soul. When it came I shriveled. 
Well, I suppose I must go and get ready for the prayer meeting, too. Every village has its own little unwritten history, handed down from lip to lip through the generations, of tragic, comic, and dramatic events. They are told at weddings and festivals, and rehearsed around winter firesides. And in these oral annals of Glen St. Mary, the tale of the Union prayer meeting held that night in the Methodist church was destined to fill an imperishable place. The Union prayer meeting was Mr. Arnold's idea. The county battalion, which had been training all winter in Charlottetown, was to leave shortly for overseas. The Four Winds Harbor boys belonging to it from the Glen and Over Harbor and Harbor Head and Upper Glen were all home on their last leave, and Mr. Arnold thought, properly enough, that it would be a fitting thing to hold a Union prayer meeting for them before they went away. Mr. Meredith having agreed, the meeting was announced to be held in the Methodist Church. Glen prayer meetings were not apt to be too well attended, but on this particular evening the Methodist Church was crowded. Everybody who could go was there. Even Miss Cornelia came, and it was the first time in her life that Miss Cornelia had ever set foot inside a Methodist church. It took no less than a world conflict to bring that about. "'I used to hate Methodists,' said Miss Cornelia calmly, when her husband expressed surprise over her going. "'But I don't hate them now. There is no sense in hating Methodists when there is a Kaiser or a Hindenburg in the world.' So Miss Cornelia went. Norman Douglas and his wife went, too and Whiskers on the Moon strutted up the aisle to a front pew, as if he fully realized what a distinction he conferred upon the building. People were somewhat surprised that he should be there, since he usually avoided all assemblages connected in any way with the war. But Mr. Meredith had said that he hoped his session would be well represented, and Mr. Pryor had evidently taken the request to heart. He wore his best black suit and white tie, his thick, tight, iron-gray curls were neatly arranged, and his broad, red-round face looked, as Susan most uncharitably thought, more sanctimonious than ever. "'The minute I saw that man coming into the church looking like that, I felt that mischief was brewing, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said afterwards. "'What form it would take I could not tell, but I knew from face of him that he had come there for no good.' The prayer-meeting opened conventionally and continued quietly. Mr. Meredith spoke first with his usual eloquence and feeling. Mr. Arnold followed with an address which even Miss Cornelia had to confess was irreproachable in taste and subject matter. And then Mr. Arnold asked Mr. Pryor to lead in prayer. Miss Cornelia had always averred that Mr. Arnold had no gumption. Miss Cornelia was not apt to err on the side of charity in her judgment of Methodist ministers. But in this case she did not greatly overshoot the mark. The Reverend Mr. Arnold certainly did not have much of that desirable, indefinable quality known as gumption, or he would never have asked Whiskers on the Moon to lead in prayer at a khaki prayer-meeting. He thought he was returning the compliment to Mr. Meredith, who, at the conclusion of his address, had asked a Methodist deacon to lead. Some people expected Mr. Pryor to refuse grumpily, and that would have made enough scandal. But Mr. Pryor bounded briskly to his feet, unctuously said, "'Let us pray,' and forthwith prayed." In a sonorous voice which penetrated to every corner of the crowded building, Mr. Pryor poured forth a flood of fluent words, and was well on in his prayer before his dazed and horrified audience awakened to the fact that they were listening to a pacifist appeal of the rankest sort. Mr. Pryor had at least the courage of his convictions, or perhaps, as people afterwards said, he thought he was safe in a church, and that it was an excellent chance to air certain opinions he dared not voice elsewhere for fear of being mobbed. He prayed that the unholy war might cease, that the deluded armies being driven to slaughter on the western front might have their eyes open to their iniquity, and repent while yet there was time, that the poor young men present in khaki, who had been hounded into a path of murder and militarism, should yet be rescued. Mr. Pryor had got this far without let or hindrance, and so paralyzed were his hearers, and so deeply imbued with their born and bred conviction that no disturbance must ever be made in a church, no matter what the provocation, that it seemed likely that he would continue unchecked to the end. But one man at least in that audience was not hampered by inherited or acquired reverence for the sacred edifice. Norman Douglas was, as Susan had often vowed crisply, nothing more or less than a pagan. But he was a rampantly patriotic pagan, and when the significance of what Mr. Pryor was saying fully dawned on him, Norman Douglas suddenly went berserk. With a positive roar he bounded to his feet in his side-pew, facing the audience, and shouted in tones of thunder, "'Stop! Stop! Stop that abominable prayer! What an abominable prayer!' Every head in the church flew up. A boy in khaki at the back gave a faint cheer. 
Mr. Meredith raised a deprecating hand, but Norman was past caring for anything like that. Eluding his wife's restraining grasp, he gave one mad spring over the front of the pew and caught the unfortunate whiskers on the moon by his coat collar. Mr. Pryor had not stopped when so bidden, but he stopped now perforce. For Norman, his long red beard literally bristling with fury, was shaking him until his bones fairly rattled, and punctuating his shakes with a lurid assortment of abusive epithets. "'You blatant beast! Shake! You malignant carrion! Shake! You pig-headed varmint! Shake! You putrid pup! Shake! You pestilential parasite! Shake! You hunnish scum! Shake! "'You indecent reptile! You—you—' you. Norman choked for a moment. Everybody believed that the next thing he would say, church or no church, would be something that would have to be spelt with asterisks. But at that moment Norman encountered his wife's eye, and he fell back with a thud on holy writ. "'You whited sepulchre!' he bellowed with a final shake, and cast whiskers on the moon from him with a vigour which impelled that unhappy pacifist to the very verge of the choir entrance door. Mr. Pryor's once ruddy face was ashen, but he turned at bay. "'I'll have the law on you for this!' he gasped. "'Do! Do!' roared Norman, making another rush. But Mr. Pryor was gone. He had no desire to fall a second time into the hands of an avenging militarist. Norman turned to the platform for one graceless, triumphant moment. "'Don't look so flabbergasted, Parsons,' he boomed. "'You couldn't do it. Nobody would expect it of the cloth. But somebody had to do it. You know you're glad I threw him out. He couldn't be let go on yammering and yodeling and yawping sedition and treason. Sedition and treason. Somebody had to deal with it.' I was born for this hour. I've had my innings in church at last. I can sit quiet for another sixty years now. Go ahead with your meeting, Parsons. I reckon you won't be troubled with any more pacifist prayers." But the spirit of devotion and reverence had fled. Both ministers realized it, and realized that the only thing to do was to close the meeting quietly and let the excited people go. Mr. Meredith addressed a few earnest words to the boys in khaki which probably saved Mr. Pryor's windows from a second onslaught. And Mr. Arnold pronounced an incongruous benediction. At least, he felt it was incongruous, for he could not at once banish from his memory the sight of gigantic Norman Douglas shaking the fat, pompous little whiskers on the moon as a huge mastiff might shake an overgrown puppy. And he knew that the same picture was in everybody's mind. Altogether, the Union prayer-meeting could hardly be called an unqualified success but it was remembered in Glen St. Mary when scores of orthodox and undisturbed assemblies were totally forgotten. "'You will never, no never, Mrs. Dr. dear, hear me call Norman Douglas a pagan again,' said Susan when she reached home. "'If Ellen Douglas is not a proud woman this night, she should be.' "'Norman Douglas did a wholly indefensible thing,' said the doctor. Pryor should have been let severely alone until the meeting was over. Then, later on, his own minister in session should deal with him.' That would have been the proper procedure. Norman's performance was utterly improper and scandalous and outrageous. But by George! The doctor threw back his head and chuckled. By George, Anne girl, it was satisfying. End of chapter 20. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 21 Love Affairs Are Horrible. Ingleside, 20th June, 1916. We have been so busy, and day after day has brought such exciting news, good and bad, that I haven't had time and composure to write in my diary for weeks. I like to keep it up regularly, for Father says a diary of the years of the war should be a very interesting thing to hand down to one's children. The trouble is, I like to write a few personal things in this blessed old book that might not be exactly what I'd want my children to read. I feel that I shall be a far greater stickler for propriety in regard to them than I am for myself. The first week in June was another dreadful one. The Austrians seemed just on the point of overrunning Italy. And then came the first awful news of the Battle of Jutland, which the Germans claimed as a great victory. Susan was the only one who carried on. 
"'You need never tell me that the Kaiser has defeated the British Navy,' she said with a contemptuous sniff. "'It is all a German lie, and that you may tie to.' And when a couple of days later we found out that she was right, and that it had been a British victory instead of a British defeat, we had to put up with a great many I told you so's. But we endured them very comfortably. It took Kitchener's death to finish Susan. For the first time I saw her down and out. We all felt the shock of it, but Susan plumbed the depths of despair. The news came at night by phone, but Susan wouldn't believe it until she saw the Enterprise headline the next day. She did not cry or faint or go into hysterics but she forgot to put salt in the soup, and that is something Susan never did in my recollection. Mother and Miss Oliver and I cried, but Susan looked at us in stony sarcasm and said, "'The Kaiser and his six sons are all alive and thriving, so the world is not left wholly desolate. Why cry, Mrs. Dr. dear?' Susan continued in this stony, hopeless condition for twenty-four hours, and then Cousin Sophia appeared and began to condole with her. "'This is terrible news, ain't it, Susan?' We might as well prepare for the worst, for it is bound to come. You said once, and well do I remember the words, Susan Baker, that you had complete confidence in God and Kitchener. Ah, well, Susan Baker, there is only God left now. Whereat Cousin Sophia put her handkerchief to her eyes pathetically, as if the world were indeed in terrible straits. As for Susan, Cousin Sophia was the salvation of her. She came to life with a jerk. "'Sophia Crawford, hold your peace,' she said sternly. "'You may be an idiot, but you need not be an irreverent idiot. It is no more than decent to be weeping and wailing, because the Almighty is the sole stay of the Allies now. As for Kitchener, his death is a great loss, and I do not dispute it. But the outcome of this war does not depend on one man's life, and now that the Russians are coming on again, you will soon see a change for the better.' Susan said this so energetically that she convinced herself, and cheered up immediately but Cousin Sophia shook her head. "'Albert's wife wants to call the baby after Brusilov,' she said. "'But I told her to wait and see what becomes of him first. Them Russians has such a habit of petering out. The Russians are doing splendidly, however, and they have saved Italy. But even when the daily news of their sweeping advance comes, we don't feel like running up the flag as we used to do. As Gertrude says, Verdun has slain all exultation.' We would all feel more like rejoicing if the victories were on the western front. "'When will the British strike?' Gertrude sighed this morning. "'We have waited so long, so long.' Our greatest local event in recent weeks was the route march the county battalion made through the county before it left for overseas. They marched from Charlottetown to Lowbridge, then round the harbour head and through the upper glen, and so down to the St. Mary station. Everybody turned out to see them, except old Aunt Fanny Clough, who is bedridden, and Mr. Pryor, who hadn't been seen out even in church since the night of the Union prayer meeting the previous week. It was wonderful and heartbreaking to see that battalion marching past. There were young men and middle-aged men in it. There was Laurie McAllister from Over Harbor, who is only sixteen, but swore he was eighteen so that he could enlist. And there was Angus Mackenzie from the Upper Glen, who is fifty-five if he is a day, and swore he was forty-four. There were two South African veterans from Lowbridge, and the three eighteen-year-old Baxter triplets from Harbour Head. Everybody cheered as they went by, and they cheered Foster Booth, who was forty, walking side by side with his son Charlie, who was twenty. Charlie's mother died when he was born, and when Charlie enlisted, Foster said he'd never yet let Charlie go anywhere he daren't go himself, and he didn't mean to begin with the Flanders trenches. At the station, Dog Monday nearly went out of his head. He tore about and sent messages to Jem by them all. Mr. Meredith read an address, and Rita Crawford recited the piper. The soldiers cheered her like mad, and cried, "'We'll follow! We'll follow! We won't break faith!' And I felt so proud to think that it was my dear brother who had written such a wonderful, heart-stirring thing. And then I looked at the khaki ranks, and wondered if those tall fellows in uniform could be the boys I have laughed with, and played with, and danced with, and teased all my life. Something seems to have touched them and set them apart. They have heard the piper's call. Fred Arnold was in the battalion, and I felt dreadfully about him, for I realized that it was because of me that he was going away with such a sorrowful expression. I couldn't help it, but I felt as badly as if I could. The last evening of his leave, Fred came up to Ingleside and told me he loved me, and asked me if I would promise to marry him some day if he ever came back. He was desperately in earnest, and I felt more wretched than I ever did in my life. I couldn't promise him that. Why, 
Even if there was no question of Ken, I don't care for Fred that way, and never could. But it seemed so cruel and heartless to send him away to the front without any hope of comfort. I cried like a baby. And yet, oh, I'm afraid that there must be something incurably frivolous about me, because right in the middle of it all, with me crying and Fred looking so wild and tragic, the thought popped into my head that it would be an unendurable thing to see that nose across from me at the breakfast table every morning of my life. There, that is one of the entries I wouldn't want my descendants to read in this journal. But it is the humiliating truth. And perhaps it's just as well that thought did come, or I might have been tricked by pity and remorse into giving him some rash assurance. If Fred's nose were as handsome as his eyes and mouth, some such thing might have happened. And then what an unthinkable predicament I should have been in! When poor Fred became convinced that I couldn't promise him, he behaved beautifully, though that rather made things worse. If he had been nasty about it, I wouldn't have felt so heartbroken and remorseful. Though why I should feel remorseful, I don't know, for I never encouraged Fred to think I cared a bit about him. Yet feel remorseful I did, and do. If Fred Arnold never comes back from overseas, this will haunt me all my life. Then Fred said if he couldn't take my love with him to the trenches, at least he wanted to feel that he had my friendship, and would I kiss him just once in good-bye before he went, perhaps forever. I don't know how I could ever have imagined that love affairs were delightful, interesting things. They are horrible. I couldn't even give poor, heart-broken Fred one little kiss because of my promise to Ken. It seemed so brutal. I had to tell Fred that of course he would have my friendship, but that I couldn't kiss him because I had promised somebody else I wouldn't. He said, "'It is—is it—Ken Ford?' I nodded. It seemed dreadful to have to tell it. It was such a sacred little secret just between me and Ken. When Fred went away I came up here to my room and cried so long and so bitterly that Mother came up and insisted on knowing what was the matter. I told her. She listened to my tale with an expression that clearly said, "'Can it be possible that anyone has been wanting to marry this baby?' But she was so nice and understanding and sympathetic, oh, just so race of Josephy, that I felt indescribably comforted. Mothers are the dearest things. But, oh, mother, I sobbed, he wanted me to kiss him good-bye, and I couldn't, and that hurt me worse than all the rest. Well, why didn't you kiss him? asked mother coolly. Considering the circumstances, I think you might have. But I couldn't, mother. I promised Ken when he went away that I wouldn't kiss anybody else until he came back. This was another high explosive for poor mother. She exclaimed with the queerest little catch in her voice, Rilla, are you engaged to Kenneth Ford? I don't know, I sobbed. You don't know? repeated mother. Then I had to tell her the whole story, too, and every time I tell it, it seems sillier and sillier to imagine that Ken meant anything serious. I felt idiotic and ashamed by the time I got through. Mother sat a little while in silence. Then she came over, sat down beside me, and took me in her arms. Don't cry, dear little Rilla, my Rilla. You have nothing to reproach yourself with in regard to Fred. And if Leslie West's son asks you to keep your lips for him, I think you may consider yourself engaged to him. But, oh, my baby, my last little baby, I have lost you. The war has made a woman of you too soon. I shall never be too much of a woman to find comfort in mother's hugs. Nevertheless, when I saw Fred marching by two days later in the parade, my heart ached unbearably. But I'm glad mother thinks I'm really engaged to Ken. End of chapter 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 22 Little Dog Monday Knows. It is two years tonight since the dance at the light when Jack Elliot brought us news of the war. Do you remember, Miss Oliver? Cousin Sophia answered for Miss Oliver. Oh, indeed, Rilla, I remember that evening only too well, and you a prancing down here to show off your party clothes. Didn't I warn you that we could not tell what was before us? Little did you think that night what was before you. Little did any of us think that, said Susan sharply, not being gifted with the power of prophecy. It does not require any great foresight, Sophia Crawford, to tell a body that she will have some trouble before her life is over. I could do as much myself." 
"'We all thought the war would be over in a few months then,' said Rilla wistfully. "'When I look back it seems so ridiculous that we ever could have supposed it. "'And now, two years later, it is no nearer the end than it was then,' said Miss Oliver gloomily. Susan clicked her knitting-needles briskly. "'Now, Miss Oliver, dear, you know that is not a reasonable remark. You know we are just two years nearer the end, whenever the end is appointed to be. Albert read in a Montreal paper today that a war expert gives it as his opinion that it will last five years more, was Cousin Sophia's cheerful contribution. It can't, cried Rilla. Then she added with a sigh, Two years ago we would have said it can't last two years. But five more years of this? If Romania comes in, as I have strong hopes now of her doing, you will see the end in five months instead of five years, said Susan. I've no faith in foreigners, sighed Cousin Sophia. The French are foreigners, retorted Susan, and look at Verdun. And think of all the Somme victories this blessed summer. The big push is on, and the Russians are still doing well. Why, General Haig says that the German officers he has captured admit that they have lost the war. "'You can't believe a word the Germans say,' protested Cousin Sophia. "'There is no sense in believing a thing just because you'd like to believe it, Susan Baker. "'The British have lost millions of men at the Somme, and how far have they got? "'Look facts in the face, Susan Baker. Look facts in the face. "'They are wearing the Germans out, and so long as that happens, it does not matter "'whether it is done a few miles east or a few miles west. "'I am not,' admitted Susan, in tremendous humility. I am not a military expert, Sophia Crawford, but even I can see that, and so could you if you were not determined to take a gloomy view of everything. The Huns have not got all the cleverness in the world. Have you not heard the story of Alistair McCallum's son Roderick from the Upper Glen? He is a prisoner in Germany, and his mother got a letter from him last week. He wrote that he was being very kindly treated, and that all the prisoners have plenty of food and so on, till you would have supposed everything was lovely. But when he signed his name, right in between Roderick and McCallum, he wrote two Gaelic words that meant all lies, and the German censor did not understand Gaelic, and thought it was all part of Roddy's name. So he let it pass, never dreaming how he was diddled. Well, I am going to leave the war to Haig for the rest of the day, and make a frosting for my chocolate cake. And when it is made, I shall put it on the top shelf. The last one I made, I left it on the lower shelf, and little Kitchener sneaked in and clawed all the icing off and ate it. We had company for tea that night, and when I went to get my cake, what a sight did I behold! "'Has that poor orphan's father never been heard from yet?' asked Cousin Sophia. "'Yes, I had a letter from him in July,' said Rilla. "'He said that when he got word of his wife's death and of my taking the baby—Mr. Meredith wrote him, you know— he wrote right away, but as he never got any answer, he had begun to think his letter must have been lost. "'It took him two years to begin to think it,' said Susan scornfully. "'Some people think very slow. Jim Anderson has not got a scratch, for all that he has been two years in the trenches. A fool for luck, as the old proverb says. "'He wrote very nicely about Jim's, and said he'd like to see him,' said Rilla. "'So I wrote and told him all about the wee man, and sent him snapshots.' Jim's will be two years old next week, and he is a perfect duck. "'You didn't used to be very fond of babies,' said Cousin Sophia. "'I'm not a bit fonder of babies in the abstract than ever I was,' said Rilla, frankly. "'But I do love Jim's, and I'm afraid I wasn't really half as glad as I should have been when Jim Anderson's letter proved that he was safe and sound.' "'You wasn't hoping the man would be killed!' cried Cousin Sophia in horrified accents. "'No, no, no, no! I, I just hoped he would go on forgetting about Jim's, Mrs. Crawford.' "'And then your pa would have the expense of raising him,' said Cousin Sophia reprovingly. "'You young creatures are terrible thoughtless.' Jims himself ran in at this juncture, so rosy and curly and kissable that he extorted a qualified compliment even from Cousin Sophia. "'He's a real healthy-looking child now, though maybe his colour is a mite too high. Sorter consumptive-looking, as you might say. I never thought you'd raise him when I saw him the day after you brung him home.' I really did not think it was in you, and I told Albert's wife so when I got home. Albert's wife says, says she, there's more in Rilla Blythe than you'd think for, Aunt Sophia. Them was her very words. More in Rilla Blythe than you'd think for. Albert's wife always had a good opinion of you. Cousin Sophia sighed, as if to imply that Albert's wife stood alone in this against the world. But Cousin Sophia really did not mean that. She was quite fond of Rilla in her own melancholy way. But young creatures had to be kept down. If they were not kept down, society would be demoralized. 
"'Do you remember your walk home from the light two years ago tonight?' whispered Gertrude Oliver to Rilla teasingly. "'I should think so,' smiled Rilla. And then her smile grew dreamy and absent. She was remembering something else, that hour with Kenneth on the sand-shore. Where would Ken be tonight? And Jem and Jerry and Walter and all the other boys who had danced and moonlighted on the old Four Winds Point that evening of mirth and laughter, their last joyous, unclouded evening. In the filthy trenches of the Somme front, with the roar of the guns and the groans of stricken men for the music of Ned Burr's violin, and the flash of star-shells for the silver sparkles on the old blue gulf. Two of them were sleeping under the Flanders poppies, Alec Burr from the Upper Glen, and Clark Manley of Lowbridge. Others were wounded in the hospitals. But so far, nothing had touched the manse and the Ingleside boys. They seemed to bear charmed lives. Yet the suspense never grew any easier to bear, as the weeks and months of war went by. It isn't as if it were some sort of fever to which you might conclude they were immune when they hadn't taken it for two years," sighed Rilla. The danger is just as great and just as real as it was the first day they went into the trenches. I know this, and it tortures me every day. And yet I can't help hoping that since they've come this far unhurt they'll come through. Oh, Miss Oliver, what would it be like not to wake up in the morning feeling afraid of the news the day would bring? I can't picture such a state of things somehow. And two years ago this morning I woke up wondering what delightful gift the new day would give me. These are the two years I thought would be filled with fun. Would you exchange them, now, for two years filled with fun?" No, said Rilla slowly. I wouldn't. It's strange, isn't it? They have been two terrible years, and yet I have a queer feeling of thankfulness for them, as if they had brought me something very precious, with all their pain. I wouldn't want to go back and be the girl I was two years ago, not even if I could. Not that I think I've made any wonderful progress, but I'm not quite the selfish, frivolous little doll I was then. I suppose I had a soul then, Miss Oliver, but I didn't know it. I know it now, and that is worth a great deal, worth all the suffering of the past two years. And still, Rilla gave a little apologetic laugh, I don't want to suffer any more, not even for the sake of more soul growth. At the end of two more years I might look back and be thankful for the development they had brought me to, but I don't want it now." "'We never do,' said Miss Oliver. That is why we are not left to choose our own means and measure of development, I suppose. No matter how much we value what our lessons have brought us, we don't want to go on with the bitter schooling. Well, let us hope for the best, as Susan says. Things are really going well now, and if Romania lines up, the end may come with a suddenness that will surprise us all. Romania did come in, and Susan remarked approvingly that its king and queen were the finest-looking royal couple she had seen pictures of. So the summer passed away. Early in September word came that the Canadians had been shifted to the Somme front, and anxiety grew tenser and deeper. For the first time Mrs. Blythe's spirit failed her a little, and as the days of suspense wore on the doctor began to look gravely at her, and veto this or that special effort in Red Cross work. Oh, let me work! Let me work, Gilbert!" she entreated feverishly. While I'm working I don't think so much. If I'm idle I imagine everything. Rest is only torture for me. My two boys are on the frightful Somme front, and surely pours day and night over aviation literature and says nothing. But I see the purpose growing in his eyes. No, I cannot rest. Don't ask it of me, Gilbert." But the doctor was inexorable. I can't let you kill yourself, Anne-girl, he said. When the boys come back, I want a mother here to welcome them. Why, you're getting transparent. It won't do. Ask Susan there if it will do." "'Oh, if Susan and you are both banded together against me,' said Anne helplessly. One day the glorious news came that the Canadians had taken Corselet and Martin Puiche, with many prisoners and guns. Susan ran up the flag and said it was plain to be seen that Haig knew what soldiers to pick for a hard job. The others dared not feel exultant. Who knew what price had been paid? Rilla woke that morning when the dawn was beginning to break, and went to her window to look out, her thick, creamy eyelids heavy with sleep. Just at dawn the world looks as it never looks at any other time. The air was cold with dew, and the orchard and grove and Rainbow Valley were full of mystery and wonder. Over the eastern hill were golden deeps and silvery pink shallows. There was no wind and Rilla heard distinctly a dog howling in a melancholy way down in the direction of the station. Was it Dog Monday? And if it were, 
Why was he howling like that? Rilla shivered. The sound had something boding and grievous in it. She remembered that Miss Oliver said once, when they were coming home in the darkness and heard a dog howl, When a dog cries like that, the angel of death is passing. Rilla listened with a curdling fear at her heart. It was Dog Monday, she felt sure of it. Whose dirge was he howling? To whose spirit was he sending that anguished greeting and farewell? Rilla went back to bed, but she could not sleep. All day she watched and waited in a dread of which she did not speak to anyone. She went down to see Dog Monday, and the station master said, That dog o' yours howled from midnight to sunrise, something weird. I don't know what got into him. I got up once and went out and hollered at him, but he paid no attention to me. He was sitting all alone in the moonlight out there at the end of the platform, and every few minutes the poor lonely little beggar'd lift his nose and howl as if his heart was breaking. He never did it afore. He always slept in his kennel, real quiet and canny from train to train, but he sure had something on his mind last night. Dog Monday was lying in his kennel. He wagged his tail and licked Rilla's hand, but he would not touch the food she brought for him. I'm afraid he's sick, she said anxiously. She hated to go away and leave him. But no bad news came that day, nor the next, nor the next. Rilla's fear lifted. Dog Monday howled no more and resumed his routine of train meeting and watching. When five days had passed, the Ingleside people began to feel that they might be cheerful again. Rilla dashed about the kitchen helping Susan with the breakfast and singing so sweetly and clearly that Cousin Sophia across the road heard her and croaked out to Mrs. Albert, "'Sing before eatin', cry before sleepin', I have always heard.' But Rilla Blythe shed no tears before the nightfall. When her father, his face grey and drawn and old, came to her that afternoon and told her that Walter had been killed in action at Corselet, she crumpled up in a pitiful little heap of merciful unconsciousness in his arms nor did she awaken to her pain for many hours. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006 Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 23 And so, good night. The fierce flame of agony had burned itself out, and the grey dust of its ashes was over all the world. Rilla's younger life recovered physically sooner than her mother. For weeks Mrs. Blythe lay ill from grief and shock. Rilla found it was possible to go on with existence, since existence had still to be reckoned with. There was work to be done, for Susan could not do all. For her mother's sake she had to put on calmness and endurance as a garment in the day. But night after night she lay in her bed weeping the bitter rebellious tears of youth, until at last tears were all wept out, and the little patient ache that was to be in her heart until she died took their place. She clung to Miss Oliver, who knew what to say and what not to say. So few people did. Kind, well-meaning callers and comforters gave Rilla some terrible moments. "'You'll get over it in time,' Mrs. William Reese said cheerfully. Mrs. Reese had three stalwart sons, not one of whom had gone to the front." "'It's such a blessing it was Walter who was taken, and not Jem,' said Miss Sarah Clow. "'Walter was a member of the church, and Jem wasn't. "'I've told Mr. Meredith many a time that he should have spoken seriously to Jem about it before he went away.' "'Poor, poor Walter,' sighed Mrs. Reese. "'Do not you come here calling him poor Walter,' said Susan indignantly, appearing in the kitchen door much to the relief of Rilla, who felt that she could endure no more just then. He was not poor. He was richer than any of you. It is you who stay at home and will not let your sons go who are poor. Poor and naked and mean and small. Pison poor. And so are your sons with all their prosperous farms and fat cattle, and their souls no bigger than a flea's, if as big." "'I came here to comfort the afflicted and not to be insulted,' said Mrs. Reese, taking her departure, unregretted by any one. Then the fire went out of Susan, and she retreated to her kitchen, laid her faithful old head on the table, and wept bitterly for a time. Then she went to work and ironed Jim's little rompers. Rilla scolded her gently for it when she herself came in to do it. "'I am not going to have you kill yourself working for any war-baby,' Susan said obstinately. "'Oh, I wish I could just keep on working all the time, Susan,' cried poor Rilla. "'And I wish I didn't have to go to sleep. "'It is hideous to go to sleep and forget it for a little while, "'and wake up and have it all rush over me anew the next morning. "'Do people ever get used to things like this, Susan? "'And, oh, Susan, I can't get away from what Mrs. Reese said. "'Did Walter suffer much? 
He was always so sensitive to pain. Oh, Susan, if I knew that he didn't, I think I could gather up a little courage and strength. This merciful knowledge was given to Rilla. A letter came from Walter's commanding officer, telling them that he had been killed instantly by a bullet during a charge at Corselet. The same day there was a letter for Rilla from Walter himself. Rilla carried it unopened to Rainbow Valley and read it there, in the spot where she had had her last talk with him. It is a strange thing to read a letter after the writer is dead, a bittersweet thing, in which pain and comfort are strangely mingled. For the first time since the blow had fallen, Rilla felt a different thing from tremulous hope and faith, that Walter of the glorious gift and the splendid ideals still lived, with just the same gift and just the same ideals. That could not be destroyed. These could suffer no eclipse. The personality that had expressed itself in that last letter, written on the eve of Corselet, could not be snuffed out by a German bullet. It must carry on, though the earthly link with things of earth were broken. "'We're going over the top tomorrow, Rilla, my Rilla,' wrote Walter. "'I wrote Mother and Di yesterday, but somehow I feel as if I must write you tonight. I hadn't intended to do any writing tonight, but I've got to.' Do you remember old Mrs. Tom Crawford over harbour, who was always saying that it was laid on her to do such and such a thing? Well, that is just how I feel. It's laid on me to write you tonight, you sister and chum of mine. There are some things I want to say before—well, before tomorrow. You and Ingleside seem strangely near me tonight. It's the first time I've felt this since I came. Always home has seemed so far away, so hopelessly far away from this hideous welter of filth and blood. But tonight it is quite close to me, and it seems to me I can almost see you, hear you speak, and I can see the moonlight shining white and still on the old hills of home. It has seemed to me ever since I came here that it was impossible that there could be calm, gentle nights and unshattered moonlight anywhere in the world. But tonight, somehow, all the beautiful things I have always loved seem to have become possible again. And this is good, and makes me feel a deep, certain, exquisite happiness. It must be autumn at home now. The harbour is a dream, and the old Glen Hills blue with haze, and Rainbow Valley a haunt of delight with wild asters blowing all over it. Our old farewell summers. I always liked that name better than Aster. It was a poem in itself. Rilla, you know I've always had premonitions. You remember the Pied Piper. But no, of course you wouldn't. You were too young. One evening long ago, when Nan and Di and Jem and the Merediths and I were together in Rainbow Valley, I had a queer vision or presentiment, whatever you like to call it. Rilla, I saw the piper coming down the valley with a shadowy host behind him. The others thought I was only pretending, but I saw him for just one moment. And Rilla, last night I saw him again. I was doing sentry go, and I saw him marching across no man's land from our trenches to the German trenches the same tall, shadowy form piping weirdly, and behind him followed boys in khaki. Rilla, I tell you I saw him. It was no fancy, no illusion. I heard his music, and then he was gone. But I had seen him, and I knew what it meant. I knew that I was among those who followed him. Rilla, the piper will pipe me west tomorrow. I feel sure of this, and Rilla, I'm not afraid. When you hear the news, remember that. I've won my own freedom here, freedom from all fear. I shall never be afraid of anything again, not of death, nor of life, if, after all, I am to go on living. And life, I think, would be the harder of the two to face, for it could never be beautiful for me again. There would always be such horrible things to remember, things that would make life ugly and painful always for me. I could never forget them. But whether it's life or death, I am not afraid, Rilla my Rilla, and I am not sorry that I came. I'm satisfied. I'll never write the poems I once dreamed of writing, but I've helped to make Canada safe for the poets of the future, for the workers of the future, ay, and the dreamers, too, for if no man dreams there will be nothing for the workers to fulfill. The future, not of Canada only, but of the world, when the red rain of Langemark and Verdun shall have brought forth a golden harvest, not in a year or two, as some foolishly think, but a generation later, when the seed sown now shall have had time to germinate and grow. Yes, I'm glad I came, Rilla. It isn't only the fate of the little sea-born island I love that is in the balance, nor of Canada, nor of England. It's the fate of mankind. That is what we're fighting for. And we shall win. Never for a moment doubt that, Rilla. For it isn't only the living who are fighting. The dead are fighting, too. 
such an army cannot be defeated. Is there laughter in your face yet, Rilla? I hope so. The world will need laughter and courage more than ever in the years that will come next. I don't want to preach. This isn't any time for it. But I just want to say something that may help you over the worst when you hear that I've gone west. I've a premonition about you, Rilla, as well as about myself. I think Ken will go back to you, and that there are long years of happiness for you by and by. And you will teach your children of the idea we fought and died for. Teach them it must be lived for as well as died for, else the price paid for it will have been given for naught. This will be part of your work, Rilla. And if you, all of you girls back in the homeland, do it, then we who don't come back will know that you have not broken faith with us. I meant to write to Una tonight, too, but I won't have time now. Read this letter to her and tell her it's really meant for both of you, you two dear, fine, loyal girls. Tomorrow, when we go over the top, I'll think of you both, of your laughter, Rilla, my Rilla, and the steadfastness in Una's blue eyes. Somehow I see those eyes very plainly tonight, too. Yes, you'll both keep faith. I'm sure of that. You and Una. And so, good night. We go over the top at dawn. Rilla read her letter over many times. There was a new light on her pale young face when she finally stood up amid the asters Walter had loved, with the sunshine of autumn around her. For the moment, at least, she was lifted above pain and loneliness. "'I will keep faith, Walter,' she said steadily. "'I will work, and teach, and learn, and laugh. Yes, I will even laugh, through all my years, because of you and because of what you gave when you followed the call.' Rilla meant to keep Walter's letter as a sacred treasure. But seeing the look on Una Meredith's face when Una had read it and held it back to her, she thought of something. Could she do it? Oh, no, she could not give up Walter's letter, his last letter. Surely it was not selfishness to keep it. A copy would be such a soulless thing. But Una, Una had so little, and her eyes were the eyes of a woman stricken to the heart, who yet must not cry out or ask for sympathy. Una, would you like to have this letter? To keep? she asked slowly. Yes, if you can give it to me, Una said dully. Then you may have it, said Rilla hurriedly. Thank you, said Una. It was all she said, but there was something in her voice which repaid Rilla for her bit of sacrifice. Una took the letter, and when Rilla had gone she pressed it against her lonely lips. Una knew that love would never come into her life now. It was buried forever under the blood-stained soil somewhere in France. No one but herself, and perhaps Rilla, knew it, would ever know it. She had no right in the eyes of her world to grieve. She must hide and bear her long pain as best she could, alone. But she, too, would keep faith. End of chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 24. Mary is just in time. The autumn of 1916 was a bitter season for Ingleside. Mrs. Blythe's return to health was slow, and sorrow and loneliness were in all hearts. Everyone tried to hide it from the others and carry on cheerfully. Rilla laughed a good deal. Nobody at Ingleside was deceived by her laughter. It came from her lips only, never from her heart. But outsiders said some people got over trouble very easily, and Irene Howard remarked that she was surprised to find how shallow Rilla Blythe really was. Why, after all her pose of being so devoted to Walter, she doesn't seem to mind his death at all. Nobody has ever seen her shed a tear or heard her mention his name. She has evidently quite forgotten him. Poor fellow! You'd really think his family would feel it more. I spoke of him to Rilla at the last junior red meeting, of how fine and brave and splendid he was, and I said life could never be just the same to me again, now that Walter had gone. We were such friends, you know. Why, I was the very first person he told about having enlisted, and Rilla answered as coolly and indifferently as if she were speaking of an entire stranger. He was just one of many fine and splendid boys who have given everything for their country. Well, I wish I could take things as calmly, but I am not made like that. I'm so sensitive. Things hurt me terribly. I really never get over them. I asked Rilla right out why she didn't put on mourning for Walter. She said her mother didn't wish it. But everyone is talking about it. Rilla doesn't wear colours. Nothing but white, protested Betty Mead. 
"'White becomes her better than anything else,' said Irene significantly. "'And we all know black doesn't suit her complexion at all. "'But, of course, I'm not saying that is the reason she doesn't wear it. "'Only it's funny. "'If my brother had died, I'd have gone into deep mourning. "'I wouldn't have had the heart for anything else. "'I confess I'm disappointed in Rilla Blythe.' "'I am not, then.' cried Betty Mead, loyally. I think Rilla is just a wonderful girl. A few years ago I admit I did think she was rather too vain and gigglesome. But now she is nothing of the sort. I don't think there is a girl in the Glen who is so unselfish and plucky as Rilla, or who has done her bit as thoroughly and patiently. Our junior Red Cross would have gone on the rocks a dozen times if it hadn't been for her tact and perseverance and enthusiasm. You know that perfectly well, Irene." "'Why, I'm not running Rilla down,' said Irene, opening her eyes widely. "'It was only her lack of feeling I was criticizing. "'I suppose she can't help it. "'Of course she's a born manager. "'Everyone knows that. "'She's very fond of managing, too, "'and people like that are very necessary, I admit. "'So don't look at me as if I'd said something perfectly dreadful, Betty, please. "'I'm quite willing to agree that Rilla Blythe is the embodiment of all the virtues, "'if that will please you. "'And no doubt it is a virtue to be quite unmoved by things that would crush most people.' Some of Irene's remarks were reported to Rilla, but they did not hurt her as they would once have done. They didn't matter, that was all. Life was too big to leave room for pettiness. She had a pact to keep and work to do. And through the long, hard days and weeks of that disastrous autumn she was faithful to her task. The war news was consistently bad, for Germany marched from victory to victory over poor Romania. Foreigners! Foreigners! Susan muttered dubiously. Russians or Romanians or whatever they may be, they are foreigners and you cannot tie to them. But after Verdun I shall not give up hope. And can you tell me, Mrs. Dr. dear, if the de Bruges is a river or a mountain range or a condition of the atmosphere? The presidential election in the United States came off in November, and Susan was red-hot over that, and quite apologetic for her excitement. I never thought I would live to see the day when I would be interested in a Yankee election, Mrs. Dr. dear. It only goes to show that we can never know what we will come to in this world, and therefore we should not be proud. Susan stayed up late on the evening of the eleventh, ostensibly to finish a pair of socks, but she phoned down to Carter Flagg's store at intervals, and when the first report came through that Hughes had been elected, she stalked solemnly upstairs to Mrs. Blythe's room and announced it in a thrilling whisper from the foot of the bed. "'I thought if you were not asleep you would be interested in knowing it. I believe it is for the best.' Perhaps he will just fall to writing notes, too, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I hope for better things. I was never partial to whiskers, but one cannot have everything. When news came in the morning that, after all, Wilson was re-elected, Susan tacked to catch another breeze of optimism. "'Well, better a fool you know than a fool you do not know, as the old proverb has it,' she remarked cheerfully. "'Not that I hold Woodrow to be a fool by any means, though by times you would not think he has the sense he was born with.' But he is a good letter-writer, at least, and we do not know if the Hughes man is even that. All things being considered, I commend the Yankees. They have shown good sense, and I do not mind admitting it. Cousin Sophia wanted them to elect Roosevelt, and is much disgruntled because they would not give him a chance. I had a hankering for him myself, but we must believe that Providence overrules these matters and be satisfied, though what the Almighty means in this affair of Romania I cannot fathom, saying it with all reverence. Susan fathomed it, or thought she did, when the Asquith ministry went down and Lloyd George became premier. "'Mrs. Dr. dear, Lloyd George is at the helm at last. I have been praying for this for many a day. Now we shall soon see a blessed change. It took the Romanian disaster to bring it about, no less, and that is the meaning of it, though I could not see it before. There will be no more shilly-shallying. I consider that the war is as good as one, and that I shall tie to, whether Bucharest falls or not.' Bucharest did fall, and Germany proposed peace negotiations, whereat Susan scornfully turned a deaf ear and absolutely refused to listen to such proposals. When President Wilson sent his famous December peace note, Susan waxed violently sarcastic. "'Woodrow Wilson is going to make peace, I understand. First Henry Ford had a try at it, and now comes Wilson. But peace is not made with ink, Woodrow, and that you may tie to,' said Susan, apostrophizing the unlucky President out of the kitchen window nearest the United States. Lloyd George's speech will tell the Kaiser what is what. And you may keep your peace screeds at home and save postage. What a pity President Wilson can't hear you, Susan, said Rilla slyly. Indeed, Rilla dear, it is a pity that he has no one near him to give him good advice, as it is clear he has not, in all those Democrats and Republicans, retorted Susan. 
I do not know the difference between them, for the politics of the Yankees is a puzzle I cannot solve, study it as I may. But as far as seeing through a grindstone goes, I am afraid, Susan shook her head dubiously, that they are all tarred with the same brush. I am thankful Christmas is over, Rilla wrote in her diary during the last week of a stormy December. We had dreaded it so, the first Christmas since Corselet. But we had all the Merediths down for dinner, and nobody tried to be gay or cheerful. We were all just quiet and friendly, and that helped. Then, too, I was so thankful that Jims had got better, so thankful that I almost felt glad. Almost, but not quite. I wonder if I shall ever feel really glad over anything again. It seems as if gladness were killed in me, shot down by the same bullet that pierced Walter's heart. Perhaps some day a new kind of gladness will be born in my soul, but the old kind will never live again. Winter set in awfully early this year. Ten days before Christmas we had a big snowstorm. At least we thought it big at the time. As it happened, it was only a prelude to the real performance. It was fine the next day, and Ingleside and Rainbow Valley were wonderful, with the trees all covered in snow and big drifts everywhere, carved into the most fantastic shapes by the chisel of the northeast wind. Father and Mother went up to Avonlea. Father thought the change would do Mother good, and they wanted to see poor Aunt Diana, whose son Jack had been seriously wounded a short time before. They left Susan and me to keep house, and Father expected to be back the next day. But he never got back for a week. That night it began to storm again, and it stormed unbrokenly for four days. It was the worst and longest storm that Prince Edward Island has known for years. Everything was disorganized, the roads were completely choked up, the trains blockaded, and the telephone wires put entirely out of commission. And then Jims took ill. He had a little cold when father and mother went away, and he kept getting worse for a couple of days, but it didn't occur to me that there was danger of anything serious. I never even took his temperature, and I can't forgive myself, because it was sheer carelessness. The truth is, I had slumped just then. Mother was away, so I let myself go. All at once I was tired of keeping up and pretending to be brave and cheerful, and I just gave up for a few days and spent most of the time lying on my face on my bed, crying. I neglected Jims. That is the hateful truth. I was cowardly and false to what I promised Walter, and if Jims had died I could never have forgiven myself. Then, the third night after father and mother went away, Jim suddenly got worse, oh, so much worse, all at once. Susan and I were all alone. Gertrude had been at Lowbridge when the storm began, and had never got back. At first we were not much alarmed. Jim's has had several bouts of croup, and Susan and Morgan and I have always brought him through without much trouble. But it wasn't very long before we were dreadfully alarmed. I never saw croup like this before, said Susan. As for me, I knew when it was too late what kind of croup it was. I knew it was not the ordinary croup, false croup, as doctors call it, but the true croup, and I knew it was a deadly and dangerous thing. And father was away, and there was no doctor nearer than Lowbridge, and we could not phone, and neither horse nor man could get through the drifts that night. Gallant little Jims put up a good fight for his life. Susan and I tried every remedy we could think of or find in father's books, but he continued to grow worse. It was heart-rending to see and hear him. He gasped so horribly for breath, the poor little soul and his face turned a dreadful bluish color and had such an agonized expression, and he kept struggling with his little hands as if he were appealing to us to help him somehow. I found myself thinking that the boys who had been gassed at the front must have looked like that, and the thought haunted me amid all my dread and misery over Jim's. And all the time the fatal membrane in his wee throat grew and thickened, and he couldn't get it up. Oh, I was just wild. I never realized how dear Jim's was to me until that moment, and I felt so utterly helpless— and then Susan gave up. We cannot save him. Oh, if your father was here! Look at him, the poor little fellow. I know not what to do. I looked at Jim's, and I thought he was dying. Susan was holding him up in his crib to give him a better chance for breath, but it didn't seem as if he could breathe at all. My little war-baby, with his dear ways and sweet roguish face, was choking to death before my very eyes, and I couldn't help him. I threw down the hot poultice I had ready in despair. Of what use was it? Jim's was dying, and it was my fault— I hadn't been careful enough. Just then, at eleven o'clock at night, the doorbell rang. Such a ring! It pealed all over the house above the roar of the storm. Susan couldn't go. She dared not lay Jims down, so I rushed downstairs. In the hall I paused just a minute. I was suddenly overcome by an absurd dread. I thought of a weird story Gertrude had told me once. An aunt of hers was alone in a house one night with her sick husband. She heard a knock at the door, and when she went and opened it there was nothing there nothing that could be seen, at least. 
but when she opened the door a deadly cold wind blew in and seemed to sweep past her right up the stairs, although it was a calm, warm summer night outside. Immediately she heard a cry. She ran upstairs and her husband was dead, and she always believed, so Gertrude said, that when she opened that door she let death in. It was so ridiculous of me to feel so frightened, but I was distracted and worn out, and I simply felt for a moment that I dared not open the door, that death was waiting outside. Then I remembered that I had no time to waste, must not be so foolish. I sprang forward and opened the door. Certainly a cold wind did blow in and filled the hall with a whirl of snow, but there on the threshold stood a form of flesh and blood, Mary Vance, coated from head to foot with snow, and she brought life, not death, with her, though I didn't know that then. I just stared at her. I haven't been turned out, grinned Mary as she stepped in and shut the door. I came up to Carter Flags two days ago, and I've been storm stayed there ever since. But old Abby Flagg got on my nerves at last, and tonight I just made up my mind to come up here. I thought I could wait this far, but I can tell you it was as much as a bargain. Once I thought I was stuck for keeps. Ain't it an awful night? I came to myself, and I knew I must hurry upstairs. I explained as quickly as I could to Mary, and left her trying to brush the snow off. Upstairs I found that Jim's was over that paroxysm, but almost as soon as I got back to the room he was in the grip of another. I couldn't do anything but moan and cry. Oh, how ashamed I am when I think of it! And yet what could I do? We had tried everything we knew. And then all at once I heard Mary Vance saying loudly behind me, Why, that child is dying! I whirled around. Didn't I know he was dying? My little Jims! I could have thrown Mary Vance out of the door or the window, anywhere at that moment. There she stood, cool and composed, looking down at my baby with those weird white eyes of hers as she might look at a choking kitten. I had always disliked Mary Vance, and just then I hated her. We have tried everything, said poor Susan dully. It is not ordinary croup. No, it's the diphthery croup, said Mary briskly, snatching up an apron, and there's mighty little time to lose, but I know what to do. When I lived over harbour with Mrs. Wiley years ago, Will Crawford's kid died of diphtheric croup, in spite of two doctors, and when old Aunt Christina McAllister heard of it—she was the one brought me round when I nearly died of pneumonia, you know—she was a wonder. No doctor was a patch on her. They don't hatch her breed of cats nowadays, let me tell you. She said she could have saved him with her grandmother's remedy if she'd been there. She told Mrs. Wiley what it was, and I've never forgot it. I have the greatest memory ever. A thing just lies in the back of my head till the time comes to use it. Got any sulphur in the house, Susan? Yes, we had sulphur. Susan went down with Mary to get it, and I held Jim's. I hadn't any hope, not the least. Mary Vance might brag as she liked. She was always bragging, but I didn't believe any grandmother's remedy could save Jim's now. Presently Mary came back. She had tied a piece of thick flannel over her mouth and nose, and she carried Susan's old tin chip pan, half full of burning coals. You watch me, she said boastfully. I've never done this, but it's killer cure. That child is dying anyway. She sprinkled a spoonful of sulphur over the coals, and then she picked up Jim's, turned him over, and held him face downward right over those choking, blinding fumes. I don't know why I didn't spring forward and snatch him away. Susan says it was because it was foreordained that I shouldn't, and I think she is right, because it did really seem that I was powerless to move. Susan herself seemed transfixed, watching Mary from the doorway. Jim's writhed in those big, firm, capable hands of Mary. Oh, yes, she is capable, all right, and choked, and wheezed, and choked, and wheezed, and I felt that he was being tortured to death. And then, all at once, after what seemed to me an hour, though it really wasn't long, he coughed up the membrane that was killing him. Mary turned him over and laid him back on his bed. He was white as marble, and the tears were pouring out of his brown eyes. But that awful, livid look was gone from his face, and he could breathe quite easily. Wasn't that some trick? said Mary gaily. I hadn't any idea how it would work, but I just took a chance. I'll smoke his throat out again once or twice before morning, just to kill all the germs. But you'll see, he'll be all right now." Jims went right to sleep—real sleep, not coma, as I feared at first. Mary smoked him, as she called it, twice through the night, and at daylight his throat was perfectly clear, and his temperature was almost normal. When I made sure of that, I turned and looked at Mary Vance. She was sitting on the lounge, laying down the law to Susan on some subject about which Susan must have known forty times as much as she did. But I didn't mind how much law she laid down, or how much she bragged. She had a right to brag. She had dared to do what I would never have dared, and had saved Jims from a horrible death. It didn't matter any more that she had once chased me through the glen with a codfish. It didn't matter that she had smeared goose-grease all over my dream of romance the night of the lighthouse dance. It didn't matter that she thought she knew more than anybody else, and always rubbed it in. I would never dislike Mary Vance again. I went over to her and kissed her. "'What's up now?' she said. "'Nothing.' Only I'm so grateful to you, Mary. 
"'Well, I think you ought to be, that's a fact. You two would have let that baby die on your hands if I hadn't happened along,' said Mary, just beaming with complacency. She got Susan and me a tip-top breakfast, and made us eat it, and bossed the life out of us, as Susan said, for two days, until the roads were open so that she could get home. Jims was almost well by that time, and father turned up. He heard our tale without saying much. Father is rather scornful, generally, about what he calls old wives' remedies. He laughed a little, and said, "'After this, Mary Vance will expect me to call her in for consultation in all my serious cases.' So Christmas was not so hard as I expected it to be. And now the new year is coming, and we are still hoping for the big push that will end the war. And Little Dog Monday is getting stiff and rheumatic from his cold vigils. But still he carries on, and surely continues to read the exploits of the aces. Oh, 1917, what will you bring? End of chapter 24 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 25 Shirley Goes. "'No, Woodrow, there will be no peace without victory,' said Susan, sticking her knitting-needle viciously through President Wilson's name in the newspaper column. "'We Canadians mean to have peace and victory, too. You, if it pleases you, Woodrow, can have the peace without the victory.' And Susan stalked off to bed with the comfortable consciousness of having got the better of the argument with the President. But a few days later she rushed to Mrs. Blythe in red-hot excitement. "'Mrs. Doctor, dear, what do you think?' A phone message has just come through from Charlottetown that Woodrow Wilson has sent that German ambassador man to the right about at last. They tell me that means war. So I begin to think that Woodrow's heart is in the right place after all, wherever his head may be, and I am going to commandeer a little sugar and celebrate the occasion with some fudge, despite the howls of the food board. I thought that submarine business would bring things to a crisis. I told Cousin Sophia so when she said it was the beginning of the end for the Allies. Don't let the doctor hear of the fudge, Susan said Anne, with a smile. You know he has laid down very strict rules for us along the lines of economy the government has asked for. Yes, Mrs. Dr. dear, and a man should be master in his own household, and his women folk should bow to his degrees. I flatter myself that I am becoming quite efficient in economizing. Susan had taken to using certain German terms with killing effect. But one can exercise a little gumption on the quiet now and then. Shirley was wishing for some of my fudge the other day, the Susan brand, as he called it, and I said, the first victory there is to celebrate I shall make you some. I consider this news quite equal to a victory, and what the doctor does not know will never grieve him. I take the whole responsibility, Mrs. Dr. dear, so do not you vex your conscience. Susan spoiled Shirley shamelessly that winter. He came home from Queen's every weekend, and Susan had all his favorite dishes for him, in so far as she could evade or wheedle the doctor, and waited on him hand and foot. Though she talked war constantly to every one else, she never mentioned it to him or before him, but she watched him like a cat watching a mouse. And when the German retreat from the Bapaume salient began and continued, Susan's exultation was linked up with something deeper than anything she expressed. Surely the end was in sight, would come now before any one else could go. "'Things are coming our way at last. We have got the Germans on the run,' she boasted. The United States has declared war at last, as I always believed they would, in spite of Woodrow's gift for letter-writing, and you will see that they will go into it with a vim, since I understand that is their habit when they do start. And we have got the Germans on the run, too. "'The States mean well,' moaned Cousin Sophia. "'But all the vim in the world cannot put them on the fighting line this spring, and the Allies will be finished before that. The Germans are just luring them on. That man Simmons says their retreat has put the Allies in a hole.' "'That man Simmons has said more than he will ever live to make good,' retorted Susan. "'I do not worry myself about his opinion as long as Lloyd George is Premier of England. He will not be bamboozled, and that you may tie to. Things look good to me. The U.S. is in the war, and we have got Kut and Baghdad back. And I would not be surprised to see the Allies in Berlin by June, and the Russians, too, since they have got rid of the Tsar. That, in my opinion, was a good piece of work. "'Time will show if it is.' said Cousin Sophia, who would have been very indignant if any one had told her that she would rather see Susan put to shame as a seer than a successful overthrow of tyranny, or even the march of the Allies down Unter der Linden. But then the woes of the Russian people were quite unknown to Cousin Sophia, while this aggravating, optimistic Susan was an ever-present thorn in her side. Just at that moment Shirley was sitting on the edge of the table in the living-room, swinging his legs, 
a brown, ruddy, wholesome lad from top to toe, every inch of him, and saying coolly, "'Mother and Dad, I was eighteen last Monday. Don't you think it's about time I joined up?' The pale mother looked at him. Two of my sons have gone, and one will never return. Must I give you two, surely? The age-old cry, Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. How the mothers of the great war echoed the old patriarch's moan of so many centuries agone. You wouldn't have me a slacker, mother. I can get into the flying corps. What say, Dad? The doctor's hands were not quite steady as he folded up the powders he was concocting for Abby Flagg's rheumatism. He had known this moment was coming yet he was not altogether prepared for it. He answered slowly, "'I won't try to hold you back from what you believe to be your duty. But you must not go unless your mother says you may.' Shirley said nothing more. He was not a lad of many words. Anne did not say anything more just then, either. She was thinking of little Joyce's grave in the old burying-ground over harbour. Little Joyce, who would have been a woman now, had she lived, of the white cross in France, and the splendid grey eyes of the little boy who had been taught his first lessons of duty and loyalty at her knee, of Jem in the terrible trenches, of Nan and Di and Rilla, waiting, 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 while the golden years of youth passed by. And she wondered if she could bear any more. She thought not. Surely she had given enough. Yet that night she told Shirley that he might go. They did not tell Susan right away. She did not know it until, a few days later, Shirley presented himself in her kitchen in his aviation uniform. Susan didn't make half the fuss she had made when Jem and Walter had gone. She said stonily, "'So they're going to take you, too.' "'Take me? No. I'm going, Susan. Got to.' Susan sat down by the table, folded her old knotted hands that had grown warped and twisted working for the Ingleside children to still their shaking, and said, "'Yes, you must go.' I did not see once why such things must be, but I can see now. "'You're a brick, Susan,' said Shirley. He was relieved that she took it so coolly. He had been a little afraid, with a boy's horror of a scene. He went out whistling gaily, but half an hour later, when pale Anne Blythe came in, Susan was still sitting there. "'Mrs. Dr. dear,' said Susan, making an admission she would once have died rather than make, "'I feel very old. Jem and Walter were yours, but Shirley is mine, and I cannot bear to think of him flying.' his machine crashing down, the life crushed out of his body, the dear little body I nursed and cuddled when he was a wee baby. "'Susan, don't!' cried Anne. "'Oh, Mrs. Dr. dear, I beg your pardon. I ought not to have said anything like that out loud. I sometimes forget that I resolved to be a heroine. This—this this has shaken me a little. But I will not forget myself again. Only if things do not go as smoothly in the kitchen for a few days, I hope you will make due allowance for me. At least— said poor Susan, forcing a grim smile in a desperate effort to require lost standing. At least flying is a clean job. He will not get so dirty and messed up as he would in the trenches. And that is well, for he has always been a tidy child. So Shirley went, not radiantly as to high adventure like Jem, not into a white flame of sacrifice like Walter, but in a cool, business-like mood, as of one doing something rather dirty and disagreeable that had just got to be done. He kissed Susan for the first time since he was five years old, and said, "'Good-bye, Susan. Mother Susan.' "'My little brown boy. My little brown boy,' said Susan. "'I wonder,' she thought bitterly, as she looked at the doctor's sorrowful face, "'if you remember how you spanked him once when he was a baby. I am thankful I have nothing like that on my conscience now.' The doctor did not remember the old discipline, but before he put on his hat to go out on his round of calls he stood for a moment in the great silent living-room that had once been full of children's laughter. "'Our last son. Our last son,' he said aloud. "'A good, sturdy, sensible lad, too. Always reminded me of my father. I suppose I ought to be proud that he wanted to go. I was proud when Jem went, even when Walter went. But our house has left us desolate.' "'I have been thinking, doctor,' old Sandy of the Upper Glen said to him that afternoon, "'that your house will be seeming very big the day.' Highland Sandy's quaint phrase struck the doctor as perfectly expressive. Ingleside did seem very big and empty that night. Yet Shirley had been away all winter except for weekends, and had always been a quiet fellow even when home. Was it because he had been the only one left that his going seemed to leave such a huge blank, that every room seemed vacant and deserted?' that the very trees on the lawn seemed to be trying to comfort each other with caresses of freshly budding boughs for the loss of the last of the little lads who had romped under them in childhood. Susan worked very hard all day and late into the night. 
When she had wound the kitchen clock and put Dr. Jekyll out, none too gently, she stood for a little while on the doorstep, looking down the glen, which lay tranced in faint, silvery light from a sinking young moon. But Susan did not see the familiar hills and harbour. She was looking at the aviation camp in Kingsport, where Shirley was that night. "'He called me Mother Susan,' she was thinking. "'Well, all our men-folk have gone now. Jem and Walter and Shirley and Jerry and Carl. And none of them had to be driven to it. So we have a right to be proud. But pride—' Susan sighed bitterly. "'Pride is cold company, and that there is no gainsaying. The moon sank lower into a black cloud in the west. The glen went out in an eclipse of sudden shadow. And thousands of miles away the Canadian boys in khaki, the living and the dead, were in possession of Vimy Ridge. Vimy Ridge is a name written in crimson and gold on the Canadian annals of the Great War. The British couldn't take it, and the French couldn't take it, said a German prisoner to his captors. But you Canadians are such fools that you don't know when a place can't be taken. So the fools took it, and paid the price. Jerry Meredith was seriously wounded at Vimy Ridge, shot in the back, the telegram said. Poor Nan, said Mrs. Blythe when the news came. She thought of her own happy girlhood at old Green Gables. There had been no tragedy like this in it. How the girls of today had to suffer! When Nan came home from Redmond two weeks later, her face showed what those weeks had meant to her. John Meredith, too, seemed to have grown old suddenly in them. Faith did not come home. She was on her way across the Atlantic as a V.A.D. Di had tried to wring from her father consent to her going also, but had been told that for her mother's sake it could not be given. So Di, after a flying visit home, went back to her Red Cross work in Kingsport. The Mayflowers bloomed in the secret nooks of Rainbow Valley. Rilla was watching for them. Jem had once taken his mother at the earliest Mayflowers. Walter brought them to her when Jem was gone. Last spring Shirley had sought them out for her. Now Rilla thought she must take the boy's place in this. But before she had discovered any, Bruce Meredith came to Ingleside one twilight with his hands full of delicate pink sprays. He stalked up the steps of the veranda and laid them on Mrs. Blythe's lap. "'Because Shirley isn't here to bring them,' he said in his funny, shy, blunt way. "'And you thought of this, you darling,' said Anne, her lips quivering, as she looked at the stocky, black-browed little chap standing before her, with his hands thrust into his pockets. "'I wrote Jem today and told him not to worry about you not getting your Mayflowers,' said Bruce seriously, "'cause I'd see to that. And I told him I would be ten pretty soon now, so it won't be very long before I'll be eighteen, and then I'll go to help him fight, and maybe let him come home for a rest while I took his place. I wrote Jerry, too. Jerry's getting better, you know.' "'Is he? Have you had any good news about him?' "'Yes. Mother had a letter today, and it said he was out of danger. "'Oh, thank God!' murmured Mrs. Blythe in a half-whisper. Bruce looked at her curiously. "'That is what Father said when Mother told him. But when I said it the other day when I found out Mr. Mead's dog hadn't heard my kitten, I thought he had shooken it to death, you know. Father looked awful solemn and said I must never say that again about a kitten. But I couldn't understand why, Mrs. Blythe. I felt awful thankful, and it must have been God that saved Stripey, because that mead dog had enormous jaws, and oh, how it shook poor Stripey! And so why couldn't I thank him? Course, added Bruce reminiscently, maybe I said it too loud, cause I was awful glad and excited when I found Stripey was all right. I most shouted it, Mrs. Blythe. Maybe if I'd said it sort of whispery like you and Father it would have been all right. Do you know, Mrs. Blythe? Bruce dropped to a whispery tone, edging a little nearer to Anne. What I would like to do to the Kaiser, if I could. What would you like to do, laddie? Norman Reese said in school today that he would like to tie the Kaiser to a tree and set cross dogs to worrying him, said Bruce gravely. And Emily Flagg said she would like to put him in a cage and poke sharp things into him. And they all said things like that. But Mrs. Blythe— Bruce took a little square paw out of his pocket and put it earnestly on Anne's knee. I would like to turn the Kaiser into a good man, a very good man— all at once, if I could. That is what I would do. Don't you think, Mrs. Blythe, that would be the very worstest punishment of all? Bless the child, said Susan. How do you make out that would be any kind of a punishment for that wicked fiend? Don't you see? said Bruce, looking levelly at Susan out of his blackly blue eyes. If he was turned into a good man, he would understand how dreadful the things he has done are, and he would feel so terrible about it that he would be more unhappy and miserable than he could ever be in any other way. He would feel just awful, and he would go on feeling like that forever. Yes, 
Bruce clenched his hands and nodded his head emphatically. "'Yes, I would make the Kaiser a good man. That is what I would do. It would serve him exactly right.'" End of chapter 25 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 26 Susan Has a Proposal of Marriage. An aeroplane was flying over Glen St. Mary, like a great bird poised against the western sky, a sky so clear and of such a pale silvery yellow that it gave an impression of a vast, wind freshened space of freedom. The little group on the Ingleside lawn looked up at it with fascinated eyes although it was by no means an unusual thing to see an occasional hovering plane that summer. Susan was always intensely excited. Who knew but that it might be Shirley away up there in the clouds, flying over to the island from Kingsport? But Shirley had gone overseas now, so Susan was not so keenly interested in this particular aeroplane and its pilot. Nevertheless, she looked at it with awe. "'I wonder, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said solemnly, what the old folks down there in the graveyard would think if they could rise out of their graves for one moment and behold that sight. I am sure my father would disapprove of it, for he was a man who did not believe in new-fangled ideas of any sort. He always cut his grain with a reaping hook to the day of his death. A mower he would not have. What was good enough for his father was good enough for him, he used to say. I hope it is not unfilial to say that I think he was wrong in that point of view, but I am not sure I go so far as to approve of aeroplanes though they may be a military necessity. If the Almighty had meant us to fly, he would have provided us with wings. Since he did not, it is plain he meant us to stick to the solid earth. At any rate, you will never see me, Mrs. Dr. dear, cavorting through the sky in an aeroplane. "'But you won't refuse to cavort a bit in Father's new automobile when it comes, will you, Susan?' teased Rilla. "'I do not expect to trust my old bones in automobiles either,' retorted Susan. "'But I do not look upon them as some narrow-minded people do.' Whiskers on the moon says the government should be turned out of office for permitting them to run on the island at all. He foams at the mouth, they tell me, when he sees one. The other day he saw one coming along that narrow side road by his wheat field, and Whiskers bounded over the fence and stood right in the middle of the road with his pitchfork. The man in the machine was an agent of some kind, and Whiskers hates agents as much as he hates automobiles. He made the car come to a halt, because there was not room to pass him on either side, and the agent could not actually run over him. Then he raised his pitchfork and shouted, "'Get out of this with your devil machine, or I will run this pitchfork clean through you!' And, Mrs. Dr. dear, if you will believe me, that poor agent had to back his car clean out to the Lowbridge Road, nearly a mile, whiskers following him every step, shaking his pitchfork and bellowing insults. Now, Mrs. Dr. dear, I call such conduct unreasonable. But all the same,' added Susan, with a sigh, what with aeroplanes and automobiles and all the rest of it, this island is not what it used to be. The aeroplane soared and dipped and circled and soared again until it became a mere speck far over the sunset hills. With the majesty of pinion which the Theban eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure fields of air, quoted Anne Blythe dreamily. I wonder, said Miss Oliver, if humanity will be any happier because of aeroplanes. It seems to me that the sum of human happiness remains much the same from age to age, no matter how it may vary in distribution, and that all the many inventions neither lessen nor increase it. "'After all, the kingdom of heaven is within you,' said Mr. Meredith, gazing after the vanishing speck, which symbolized man's latest victory in a world-old struggle. It does not depend on material achievements and triumphs. "'Nevertheless, an aeroplane is a fascinating thing,' said the doctor. It has always been one of humanity's favorite dreams, the dream of flying. Dream after dream comes true, or rather is made true by persevering effort. I should like to have a flight in an aeroplane myself. Shirley wrote me that he was dreadfully disappointed in his first flight, said Rilla. He had expected to experience the sensation of soaring up from the earth like a bird, and instead he just had the feeling that he wasn't moving at all, but that the earth was dropping away under him. And the first time he went up alone he suddenly felt terribly homesick. He had never felt like that before, but all at once, he said, he felt as if he were adrift in space, and he had a wild desire to get back home to the old planet and the companionship of fellow creatures. He soon got over that feeling, but he says his first flight alone was a nightmare to him because of that dreadful sensation of ghastly loneliness. The aeroplane disappeared. The doctor threw back his head with a sigh. 
When I have watched one of those birdmen out of sight, I come back to earth with an odd feeling of being merely a crawling insect. Anne, he said, turning to his wife, do you remember the first time I took you for a buggy ride in Avonlea, the night we went to the Carmody concert, the first fall you taught in Avonlea? I had our little black mare with the white star on her forehead in a shining brand new buggy, and I was the proudest fellow in the world, barring none. I suppose our grandson will be taking his sweetheart out quite casually for an evening fly in his aeroplane. An aeroplane won't be as nice as little Silverspot was, said Anne. A machine is simply a machine, but Silverspot, why, she was a personality, Gilbert. A drive behind her had something in it that not even a flight among sunset clouds could have. No. I don't envy my grandson's sweetheart, after all. Mr. Meredith is right. The kingdom of heaven and of love and of happiness doesn't depend on externals. Besides, said the doctor gravely, our said grandson will have to give most of his attention to the aeroplane. He won't be able to let the reins lie on its back while he gazes into his lady's eyes. And I have an awful suspicion that you can't run an aeroplane with one arm. No, the doctor shook his head. I believe I'd still prefer Silver Spot after all. The Russian line broke again that summer, and Susan said bitterly that she had expected it ever since Kerensky had gone and got married. Far be it from me to decry the holy state of matrimony, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I felt that when a man was running a revolution he had his hands full, and should have postponed marriage until a more fitting season. The Russians are done for this time, and there would be no sense in shutting our eyes to the fact. But have you seen Woodrow Wilson's reply to the Pope's peace proposals? It is magnificent. I really could not have expressed the rights of the matter better myself. I feel that I can forgive Wilson everything for it. He knows the meaning of words, and that you may tie to. Speaking of meanings, have you heard the latest story about Whiskers on the Moon, Mrs. Dr. dear? It seems he was over at the Lowbridge Road School the other day, and took a notion to examine the fourth class in spelling. They have the summer term there yet, you know, with the spring and fall vacations, being rather backward people on that road. My niece, Ella Baker, goes to that school, and she it was who told me the story. The teacher was not feeling well, having a dreadful headache, and she went out to get a little fresh air while Mr. Pryor was examining the class. The children got along all right with the spelling, but when Whiskers began to question them about the meanings of the words they were all at sea, because they had not learned them. Ella and the other big scholars felt terrible over it. They love their teacher so, and it seems Mr. Pryor's brother, Abel Pryor, who is trustee of that school, is against her and has been trying to turn the other trustees over to his way of thinking and Ella and the rest were afraid that if the fourth class didn't tell Whiskers the meanings of the words, he would think the teacher was no good and tell Abel so, and Abel would have a fine handle. But little Sandy Logan saved the situation. He is a homeboy, but he is as smart as a steel trap, and he sized up Whiskers on the moon right off. "'What does anatomy mean?' Whiskers demanded. "'A pain in your stomach,' Sandy replied, quick as a flash, and never batting an eyelid. Whiskers on the moon is a very ignorant man, Mrs. Dr. Dear. He didn't know the meaning of the words himself, and he said, "'Very good, very good.' The class caught right on. At least three or four of the brighter ones did, and they kept up the fun. Jean Blaine said that acoustic meant a religious squabble, and Muriel Baker said that an agnostic was a man who had indigestion, and Jim Carter said that acerbity meant that you ate nothing but vegetable food, and so on all down the list. Whiskers swallowed it all, and kept saying, "'Very good, very good,' until Ella thought that die she would trying to keep a straight face. When the teacher came in, Whiskers complimented her on the splendid understanding the children had of their lesson, and said he meant to tell the trustees what a jewel they had. It was very unusual, he said, to find a fourth class who could answer up so prompt when it came to explaining what words meant. He went off beaming. But Ella told me this as a great secret, Mrs. Dr. dear, and we must keep it as such, for the sake of the Lowbridge Road teacher. It would likely be the ruin of her chances of keeping the school if Whiskers should ever find out how he had been bamboozled. Mary Vance came up to Ingleside that same afternoon to tell them that Miller Douglas, who had been wounded when the Canadians took Hill 70, had had to have his leg amputated. The Ingleside folk sympathized with Mary, whose zeal and patriotism had taken some time to kindle, but now burned with a glow as steady and bright as anyone's. Some folk have been twitting me about having a husband with only one leg. But, said Mary, rising to a lofty height, I would rather Miller with only one leg than any other man in the world with a dozen. Unless, she added as an afterthought, unless it was Lloyd George. Well, I must be going. I thought you'd be interested in hearing about Miller, so I ran up from the store, but I must hustle home, for I promised Luke McAllister I'd help him build his grain stack this evening. 
It's up to us girls to see that the harvest is got in, since the boys are so scarce. I've got overalls, and I can tell you they're real becoming. Mrs. Alec Douglas says they're indecent and shouldn't be allowed, and even Mrs. Elliot kinder looks askance at them. But, bless you, the world moves, and anyhow there's no fun for me like shocking Kitty Alec. "'By the way, father,' said Rilla, "'I'm going to take Jack Flagg's place in his father's store for a month. I promised him today that I would, if you didn't object. Then he can help the farmers get the harvest in. I don't think I'd be much use in a harvest myself, though lots of the girls are, but I can set Jack free while I do his work. Jim's isn't much bother in the daytime now, and I'll always be home at night. "'Do you think you'll like weighing out sugar and beans and trafficking in butter and eggs?' said the doctor, twinkling. "'Probably not. That isn't the question. It's just one way of doing my bit.' So Rilla went behind Mr. Flagg's counter for a month, and Susan went into Albert Crawford's oatfields. "'I'm as good as any of them yet,' she said proudly. "'Not a man of them can beat me when it comes to building a stack. When I offered to help, Albert looked doubtful. "'I'm afraid the work will be too hard for you,' he said. "'Try me for a day and see,' said I. "'I will do my darndest.' None of the Ingleside folks spoke for just a moment. Their silence meant that they thought Susan's pluck in working out quite wonderful. But Susan mistook their meaning, and her sunburned face grew red. "'This habit of swearing seems to be growing on me, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said apologetically. "'To think that I should be acquiring it at my age! It is such a dreadful example to the young girls. I am of the opinion it comes of reading the newspaper so much. They are so full of profanity, and they do not spell it with stars, either, as used to be done in my young days.' This war is demoralizing everybody. Susan, standing on a load of grain, her gray hair whipping in the breeze, and her skirt kilted up to her knees for safety and convenience—no overalls for Susan, if you please—neither a beautiful nor a romantic figure, but the spirit that animated her gaunt arms was the self-same one that captured Vimy Ridge and held the German legions back from Verdun. It is not the least likely, however, that this consideration was the one which appealed most strongly to Mr. Pryor when he drove past one afternoon, and saw Susan pitching sheaves gamely. Smart woman, that, he reflected. Worth two of many a younger one yet. I might do worse. I might do worse. If Milgrave comes home alive, I'll lose Miranda, and hired housekeepers cost more than a wife, and are liable to leave a man in the lurch any time. I'll think it over. A week later Mrs. Blythe, coming up from the village late in the afternoon, paused at the gate of Ingleside in an amazement which temporarily bereft her of the power of motion. An extraordinary sight met her eyes. Round the end of the kitchen burst Mr. Pryor, running as stout pomp as Mr. Pryor had not run in years, with terror imprinted on every lineament, a terror quite justifiable, for behind him, like an avenging fate, came Susan, with a huge smoking iron pot grasped in her hands, and an expression in her eye that boded ill to the object of her indignation if she should overtake him. Pursuer and pursued tore across the lawn. Mr. Pryor reached the gate a few feet ahead of Susan, wrenched it open, and fled down the road without a glance at the transfixed lady of Ingleside. "'Susan!' gasped Anne. Susan halted in her mad career, set down her pot, and shook her fist after Mr. Pryor, who had not ceased to run, evidently believing that Susan was still full cry after him. "'Susan, what does this mean?' demanded Anne, a little severely. "'You may well ask that, Mrs. Dr. dear,' Susan replied wrathfully. "'I have not been so upset in years. "'That—that—that that, that pacifist has actually had the audacity to come up here and, in my own kitchen, to ask me to marry him! "'Him!' Anne choked back a laugh. "'But, Susan, couldn't you have found a—well, a less spectacular method of refusing him?' Think what a gossip this would have made if anyone had been going past and had seen such a performance. Indeed, Mrs. Dr. dear, you are quite right. I did not think of it, because I was quite past thinking rationally. I was just clean mad. Come in the house, and I will tell you all about it. Susan picked up her pot and marched into the kitchen, still trembling with wrathful excitement. She set her pot on the stove with a vicious thud. Wait a moment until I open all the windows to air this kitchen well, Mrs. Dr. dear. There. That is better. And I must wash my hands, too, because I shook hands with Whiskers on the Moon when he came in. Not that I wanted to, but when he stuck out his fat, oily hand, I did not know just what else to do at the moment. I had just finished my afternoon cleaning, and, thanks be, everything was shining and spotless. And thought I, now that dye is boiling, and I will get my rug-rags and have them nicely out of the way before supper. Just then a shadow fell over the floor, and looking up I saw Whiskers on the Moon standing in the doorway, dressed up, and looking as if he had just been starched and ironed. 
I shook hands with him, as aforesaid, Mrs. Dr. dear, and told him you and the doctor were both away. But he said, I have come to see you, Miss Baker. I asked him to sit down, for the sake of my own manners, and then I stood there right in the middle of the floor and gazed at him as contemptuously as I could. In spite of his brazen assurance, this seemed to rattle him a little. But he began trying to look sentimental at me out of his little piggy eyes, and all at once an awful suspicion flashed into my mind. Something told me, Mrs. Dr. dear, that I was about to receive my first proposal. I have always thought that I would like to have just one offer of marriage to reject, so that I might be able to look other women in the face. But you will not hear me bragging of this. I consider it an insult, and if I could have thought of any way of preventing it, I would. But just then, Mrs. Dr. dear, you will see I was at a disadvantage, being taken so completely by surprise. Some men, I am told, consider a little preliminary courting the proper thing before a proposal, if only to give fair warning of their intentions. But Whiskers on the Moon probably thought it was any port in a storm for me, and that I would jump at him. Well, he is undeceived. Yes, he is undeceived, Mrs. Dr. dear. I wonder if he has stopped running yet. I understand that you don't feel flattered, Susan, but couldn't you have refused him a little more delicately than by chasing him off the premises in such a fashion? Well, maybe I might have, Mrs. Dr. dear, and I intended to, but one remark he made aggravated me beyond my powers of endurance. If it had not been for that, I would not have chased him with my dye-pot. I will tell you the whole interview. Whiskers sat down, as I have said, and right beside him on another chair Doc was lying. The animal was pretending to be asleep, but I knew very well he was not, for he has been hide all day, and hide never sleeps. By the way, Mrs. Dr. dear, have you noticed that that cat is far oftener hide than Jekyll now? The more victories Germany wins, the hider he becomes. I leave you to draw your own conclusions from that. I suppose Whiskers thought he might curry favour with me by praising the creature, little dreaming what my real sentiments towards it were, so he stuck out his pudgy hand and stroked Hyde's back. "'What a nice cat!' he said. The nice cat flew at him and bit him. Then it gave a fearful yowl and bounded out of the door. Whiskers looked after it quite amazed. "'That is a queer kind of a garment,' he said. I agreed with him on that point, but I was not going to let him see it. Besides, what business had he to call our cat a varmint? "'It may be a varmint, or it may not,' I said. "'But it knows the difference between a Canadian and a Hun.' "'You would have thought, would you not, Mrs. Dr. dear, "'that a hint like that would have been enough for him. "'But it went no deeper than his skin. "'I saw him settling back, quite comfortable, as if for a good talk, "'and thought I, if there is anything coming, "'it may as well come soon and be done with, "'for with all these rags to die before supper "'I have no time to waste in flirting. "'So I spoke right out. "'If you have anything particular to discuss with me, Mr. Pryor, "'I would feel obliged if you would mention it without loss of time, "'because I am very busy this afternoon.' He fairly beamed at me out of that circle of red whisker, and said, "'You are a business-like woman, and I agree with you. There is no use in wasting time beating around the bush. I came up here to-day to ask you to marry me.' So there it was, Mrs. Dr. dear. I had a proposal at last, after waiting sixty-four years for one. I just glared at that presumptuous creature, and I said, "'I would not marry you if you were the last man on earth, Josiah Pryor. So there you have my answer, and you can take it away forthwith.' You never saw a man so taken aback as he was, Mrs. Dr. dear. He was so flabbergasted that he just blurted out the truth. "'Why, I thought you'd be only too glad to get a chance to be married,' he said. That was when I lost my head, Mrs. Dr. dear. Do you think I had a good excuse when a Hun and a pacifist made such an insulting remark to me? "'Go!' I thundered, and I just caught up that iron pot. I could see that he thought I had suddenly gone insane, and I suppose he considered an iron pot full of boiling dye was a dangerous weapon in the hands of a lunatic. At any rate he went, and stood not upon the order of his going, as you saw for yourself. And I do not think we will see him back here proposing to us again in a hurry. No, I think he has learned that there is at least one single woman in Glen St. Mary who has no hankering to become Mrs. Whiskers on the Moon. End of chapter 26 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 27. Waiting. Ingleside, 1st November, 1917. It is November, and the glen is all grey and brown, except where the Lombardy poplars stand up here and there like great golden torches in the sombre landscape although every other tree has shed its leaves. It has been very hard to keep our courage alight of late. 
The Caporetto disaster is a dreadful thing, and not even Susan can extract much consolation out of the present state of affairs. The rest of us don't try. Gertrude keeps saying desperately, they must not get Venice, they must not get Venice, as if by saying it often enough she can prevent them. But what is to prevent them from getting Venice I cannot see. Yet as Susan fails not to point out, there was seemingly nothing to prevent them from getting to Paris in 1914, yet they did not get it, and she affirms they shall not get Venice either. Oh, how I hope and pray they will not! Venice, the beautiful queen of the Adriatic! Although I have never seen it, I feel about it just as Byron did. I have always loved it. It has always been to me a fairy city of the heart. Perhaps I caught my love of it from Walter, who worshipped it. It was always one of his dreams to see Venice. I remember we planned it once, down in Rainbow Valley, one evening just before the war broke out, that some time we would go together and see it and float in a gondola through its moonlit streets. Every fall since the war began there has been some terrible blow to our troops. Antwerp in 1914, Serbia in 1915, last fall Romania, and now Italy, the worst of all. I think I would give up in despair, if it were not for what Walter said in his dear last letter, that the dead as well as the living were fighting on our side, and such an army cannot be defeated. No, it cannot. We will win in the end. I will not doubt it for one moment. To let myself doubt would be to break faith. We have all been campaigning furiously of late for the new victory loan. We junior Reds canvassed diligently and landed several tough old customers who had at first flatly refused to invest. I, even I, tackled whiskers on the moon. I expected a bad time and a refusal, but to my amazement he was quite agreeable and promised on the spot to take a thousand-dollar bond. He may be a pacifist, but he knows a good investment when it is handed out to him. Five and a half per cent is five and a half per cent, even when a militaristic government pays it. Father, to tease Susan, says it was her speech at the Victory Loan campaign meeting that converted Mr. Pryor. I don't think that at all likely, since Mr. Pryor has been publicly very bitter against Susan ever since her quite unmistakable rejection of his lover-like advances. But Susan did make a speech, and the best one at the meeting, too. It was the first time she ever did such a thing, and she vows it will be the last. Everybody in the Glen was at the meeting, and quite a number of speeches were made, but somehow things were a little flat and no especial enthusiasm could be worked up. Susan was quite dismayed at the lack of zeal, because she had been burningly anxious that the island should go over the top in regard to its quota. She kept whispering viciously to Gertrude and me that there was no ginger in the speeches. And when nobody went forward to subscribe to the loan at the close, Susan lost her head. At least, that is how she describes it herself. She bounded to her feet, her face grim and set under her bonnet. Susan is the only woman in Glen St. Mary who still wears a bonnet, and said sarcastically and loudly, no doubt it is much cheaper to talk patriotism than it is to pay for it. And we are asking charity, of course. We are asking you to lend us your money for nothing. No doubt the Kaiser will feel quite downcast when he hears of this meeting. Susan has an unshaken belief that the Kaiser's spies, presumably represented by Mr. Pryor, promptly inform him of every happening in our glen. Norman Douglas shouted out, "'Hear, hear!' And some boy at the back said, "'What about Lloyd George?' in a tone Susan didn't like. Lloyd George is her pet hero now that Kitchener is gone. "'I stand behind Lloyd George every time,' retorted Susan. "'I suppose that will hearten him up greatly,' said Warren Mead, with one of his disagreeable haw-haws. Warren's remark was spark to powder. Susan just sailed in, as she put it, and said her say. She said it remarkably well, too. There was no lack of ginger in her speech, anyhow. When Susan is warmed up, she has no mean powers of oratory, and the way she trimmed those men down was funny and wonderful and effective all at once. She said it was the likes of her, millions of her, that did stand behind Lloyd George, and did hearten him up. That was the keynote of her speech. Dear old Susan. She's a perfect dynamo of patriotism and loyalty and contempt for slackers of all kinds, and when she let it loose on that audience in her one grand outburst, she electrified it. Susan always vows she is no suffragette, but she gave womanhood its due that night, and she literally made those men cringe. When she finished with them, they were ready to eat out of her hand. She wound up by ordering them, yes, ordering them, to march up to the platform forthwith and subscribe for victory bonds. And after wild applause, most of them did, even Warren Mead. When the total amount subscribed came out in the Charlottetown dailies the next day, we found that the Glen led every district on the island and certainly Susan has the credit for it. She herself, after she came home that night, was quite ashamed, and evidently feared that she had been guilty of unbecoming conduct. She confessed to Mother that she had been rather unladylike. 
We were all, except Susan, out for a trial ride in Father's new automobile tonight. A very good one we had, too, though we did get ingloriously ditched at the end, owing to a certain grim old dame, to wit Miss Elizabeth Carr of the Upper Glen, who wouldn't rein her horse out to let us pass, honk as we might. Father was quite furious, but in my heart I believe I sympathized with Miss Elizabeth. If I had been a spinster lady, driving along behind my old nag, in maiden meditation fancy-free, I wouldn't have lifted a rein when an obstreperous car hooted blatantly behind me. I should have just sat up as dourly as she did, and said, "'Take the ditch, if you are determined to pass.' We did take the ditch, and got up to our axles in sand, and sat foolishly there while Miss Elizabeth clucked up her horse and rattled victoriously away. Jem will have a laugh when I write him this. He knows Miss Elizabeth of old. But will Venice be saved? 19th November, 1917 It is not saved yet. It is still in great danger. But the Italians are making a stand at last on the Piave line. To be sure, military critics say they cannot possibly hold it, and must retreat to the Adige. But Susan and Gertrude and I say they must hold it, because Venice must be saved. So what are the military critics to do? Oh, if I could only believe that they can hold it! Our Canadian troops have won another great victory. They have stormed the Passchendaele Ridge and held it in the face of all counter-attacks. None of our boys were in the battle, but, oh, the casualty list of other people's boys! Joe Milgrave was in it, but came through safe. Miranda had some bad days until she got word from him. But it is wonderful how Miranda has bloomed out since her marriage. She isn't the same girl at all. Even her eyes seem to have darkened and deepened, though I suppose that is just because they glow with the greater intensity that has come to her. She makes her father stand round in a perfectly amazing fashion. She runs up the flag whenever a yard of trench on the western front is taken, and she comes up regularly to our junior Red Cross, and she does—yes, she does—put on funny little married woman airs that are quite killing. But she is the only war bride in the Glen, and surely nobody need grudge her the satisfaction she gets out of it. The Russian news is bad, too. Kerensky's government has fallen, and Lenin is dictator of Russia. Somehow it is very hard to keep up courage in the dull hopelessness of these grey autumn days of suspense and boding news. But we are beginning to get in a low, as old Highland Sandy says, over the approaching election. Conscription is the real issue at stake, and it will be the most exciting election we ever had. All the women who have got the age, to quote Joe Poirier, and who have husbands, sons, and brothers at the front, can vote. Oh, if only I were twenty-one! Gertrude and Susan are both furious because they can't vote. It is not fair, Gertrude says passionately. There is Agnes Carr who can vote because her husband went. She did everything she could to prevent him from going, and now she is going to vote against the Union government. Yet I have no vote because my man at the front is only my sweetheart and not my husband. As for Susan, when she reflects that she cannot vote, while a rank old pacifist like Mr. Pryor can, and will, her comments are sulphurous. I really feel sorry for the Elliots and Crawfords and McAllisters over harbour. They have always lined up in clearly divided camps of liberal and conservative, and now they are torn from their moorings. I know I'm mixing my metaphors dreadfully, and set hopelessly adrift. It will kill some of those old grits to vote for Sir Robert Borden's side, and yet they have to because they believe the time has come when we must have conscription. And some poor conservatives who are against conscription must vote for Laurier, who always has been anathema to them. Some of them are taking it terribly hard. Others seem to be in much the same attitude as Mrs. Marshall Elliott has come to be regarding church union. She was up here last night. She doesn't come as often as she used to. She is growing too old to walk this far. Dear old Miss Cornelia. I hate to think of her growing old. We have always loved her so, and she has always been so good to us Ingleside young fry. She used to be so bitterly opposed to church union, but last night, when Father told her it was practically decided, she said in a resigned tone, well, in a world where everything is being rent and torn, what matters one more rending and tearing? Anyhow, compared with Germans, even Methodists seem attractive to me. Our junior R.C. goes on quite smoothly, in spite of the fact that Irene has come back to it, having fallen out with the Lowbridge Society, I understand. She gave me a sweet little jab last meeting, about knowing me across the square in Charlottetown by my green velvet hat. Everybody knows me by that detestable and detested hat. This will be my fourth season for it. Even Mother wanted to get me a new one this fall, but I said no. As long as the war lasts, so long do I wear that velvet hat in winter. 23rd November, 1917 The Piave line still holds, and General Bing has won a splendid victory at Cambrai. I did run up the flag for that, but Susan only said, I shall set a kettle of water on the kitchen range tonight. I notice little Kitchener always has an attack of croup after any British victory. 
I do hope he has no pro-German blood in his veins. Nobody knows much about his father's people. Jims has had a few attacks of croup this fall, just the ordinary croup, not that terrible thing he had last year. But whatever blood runs in his little veins, it is good, healthy blood. He is rosy and plump and curly and cute. And he says such funny things and asks such comical questions. He likes very much to sit in a special chair in the kitchen. But that is Susan's favorite chair, too. And when she wants it, out Jims must go. The last time she put him out of it, he turned around and asked solemnly, "'When you are dead, Susan, can I sit in that chair?' Susan thought it quite dreadful, and I think that was when she began to feel anxiety about his possible ancestry. The other night I took Jims with me for a walk down to the store. It was the first time he had ever been out so late at night, and when he saw the stars he exclaimed, "'Oh, Willa, see the big moon and all the little moons!' And last Wednesday morning, when he woke up, my little alarm clock had stopped because I had forgotten to wind it up. Jims bounded out of his crib and ran across to me, his face quite aghast above his little blue flannel pajamas. "'The clock is dead!' he gasped. "'Oh, Willa, the clock is dead!' One night he was quite angry with both Susan and me because we would not give him something he wanted very much. When he said his prayers, he plumped down roughly— and when he came to the petition, Make me a good boy, he tacked on emphatically, And please make Willa and Susan good, cause they're not. I don't go about quoting Jim's speeches to all I meet. That always bores me when other people do it. I just enshrine them in this old hotchpotch of a journal. This very evening, as I put Jim's to bed, he looked up and asked me gravely, Why can't yesterday come back, Willa? Oh, why can't it, Jim's? That beautiful yesterday of dreams and laughter when our boys were home— when Walter and I read and rambled and watched new moons and sunsets together in Rainbow Valley. If it could just come back. But yesterday's never come back, little Jims, and the todays are dark with clouds, and we dare not think about the tomorrows. 11th December, 1917. Wonderful news came today. The British troops captured Jerusalem yesterday. We ran up the flag, and some of Gertrude's old sparkle came back to her for a moment. After all, she said, it is worth while to live in the days which see the object of the Crusades attained. The ghosts of all the Crusaders must have crowded the walls of Jerusalem last night, with Coeur de Lyon at their head. Susan had cause for satisfaction also. "'I am so thankful I can pronounce Jerusalem and Hebron,' she said. "'They give me a real comfortable feeling after Przemysl and Brest-Litovsk. "'Well, we have got the Turks on the run, at least, and Venice is safe and Lord Lansdowne is not to be taken seriously.' and I see no reason why we should be downhearted. Jerusalem. The meteor flag of England floats over you. The crescent is gone. How Walter would have thrilled over that. 18th December, 1917. Yesterday the election came off. In the evening Mother and Susan and Gertrude and I foregathered in the living room and waited in breathless suspense, Father having gone down to the village. We had no way of hearing the news, for Carter Flagg's store is not on our line and when we tried to get it, Central always answered that the line was busy, as no doubt it was, for everybody for miles around was trying to get Carter's store for the same reason we were. About ten o'clock Gertrude went to the phone and happened to catch someone from over harbour talking to Carter Flagg. Gertrude shamelessly listened in, and got for her comforting what eavesdroppers are proverbially supposed to get, to wit, unpleasant hearing. The Union government had done nothing in the West. We looked at each other in dismay. If the government had failed to carry the West, it was defeated. "'Canada is disgraced in the eyes of the world,' said Gertrude bitterly. "'If everybody was like the Mark Crawfords over harbour, this would not have happened,' groaned Susan. "'They locked up their uncle in the barn this morning, and would not let him out until he promised to vote union. That is what I call effective argument, Mrs. Dr. dear.' Gertrude and I couldn't rest after all that. We walked the floor until our legs gave out, and we had to sit down perforce. Mother knitted away as steadily as clockwork, and pretended to be calm and serene— pretended so well that we were all deceived and envious until the next day when I caught her ravelling out four inches of her sock. She had knit that far past where the heel should have begun. It was twelve before Father came home. He stood in the doorway and looked at us, and we looked at him. We did not dare ask him what the news was. Then he said that it was Laurier who had done nothing in the West, and that the Union government was in with a big majority. Gertrude clapped her hands. I wanted to laugh and cry— Mother's eyes flashed with their old-time starriness, and Susan emitted a queer sound between a gasp and a whoop. "'This will not comfort the Kaiser much,' she said. Then we went to bed, but were too excited to sleep. Really, as Susan said solemnly this morning, "'Mrs. Dr. dear, I think politics are too strenuous for women.'" 31st December, 1917 Our fourth war Christmas is over. 
We are trying to gather up some courage wherewith to face another year of it. Germany has, for the most part, been victorious all summer. And now they say she has all her troops from the Russian front ready for a big push in the spring. Sometimes it seems to me that we just cannot live through the winter waiting for that. I had a great batch of letters from overseas this week. Shirley is at the front now, too, and writes about it all as coolly and matter-of-factly as he used to write a football at Queen's. Carl wrote that it had been raining for weeks, and that nights in the trenches always made him think of the night long ago when he did penance in the graveyard for running away from Henry Warren's ghost. Carl's letters are always full of jokes and bits of fun. They had a great rat hunt the night before he wrote, spearing rats with their bayonets, and he got the best bag and won the prize. He has a tame rat that knows him and sleeps in his pocket at night. Rats don't worry Carl as they do some people. He was always chummy with all little beasts. He says he is making a study of the habits of the trench rat and means to write a treatise on it some day that will make him famous. Ken wrote a short letter. His letters are all rather short now, and he doesn't often slip in those dear little sudden sentences I love so much. Sometimes I think he has forgotten all about the night he was here to say good-bye. And then there will be just a line or a word that makes me think he remembers and always will remember. For instance, Today's letter hadn't a thing in it that mightn't have been written to any girl, except that he signed himself Your Kenneth instead of Yours Kenneth, as he usually does. Now, did he leave that S off intentionally, or was it only carelessness? I shall lie awake half the night wondering. He is a captain now. I am glad and proud. And yet, Captain Ford sounds so horribly far away and high up. Ken and Captain Ford seem like two different persons. I may be practically engaged to Ken— mother's opinion on that point is my stay in bulwark, but I can't be to Captain Ford. And Jem is a lieutenant now. Won his promotion on the field. He sent me a snapshot taken in his new uniform. He looked thin and old. Old, my boy brother Jem. I can't forget mother's face when I showed it to her. That, my little Jem, the baby of the old house of dreams, was all she said. There was a letter from Faith, too. She is doing V.A.D. work in England, and writes hopefully and brightly. I think she is almost happy. She saw Jem on his last leave, and she is so near him she could go to him if he were wounded. That means so much to her. Oh, if only I were with her! But my work is here at home. I know Walter wouldn't have wanted me to leave Mother, and in everything I try to keep faith with him, even to the little details of daily life. Walter died for Canada. I must live for her. That is what he asked me to do. 28th January, 1918. "'I shall anchor my storm-tossed soul to the British fleet and make a batch of bran-biscuits,' said Susan to-day to Cousin Sophia, who had come in with some weird tale of a new and all-conquering submarine just launched by Germany. But Susan is a somewhat disgruntled woman at present, owing to the regulations regarding cookery. Her loyalty to the Union government is being sorely tried. It surmounted the first strain gallantly. When the order about flour came, Susan said, quite cheerfully, I am an old dog to be learning new tricks, but I shall learn to make war-bread if it will help defeat the Huns. But the later suggestions went against Susan's grain. Had it not been for father's decree, I think she would have snapped her fingers at Sir Robert Borden. Talk about trying to make bricks without straw, Mrs. Dr. dear. How am I to make cake without butter or sugar? It cannot be done. Not cake that is cake. Of course one can make a slab, Mrs. Dr. dear. And we cannot even camouflage it with a little icing. To think that I should have lived to see the day when a government at Ottawa should step into my kitchen and put me on rations. Susan would give the last drop of her blood for her king and country, but to surrender her beloved recipes is a very different and much more serious matter. I had letters from Nan and Di, too, or rather notes. They are too busy to write letters, for exams are looming up. They will graduate in arts this spring. I am evidently to be the dunce of the family. But somehow I never had any hankering for a college course, and even now it doesn't appeal to me. I'm afraid I'm rather devoid of ambition. There is only one thing I really want to be, and I don't know if I'll be it or not. If not, I don't want to be anything. But I shan't write it down. It is all right if I think it, but as Cousin Sophia would say, it might be brazen to write it down. I will write it down. I won't be cowed by the conventions in Cousin Sophia. I want to be Kenneth Ford's wife. There now. I've just looked in the glass, and I hadn't the sign of a blush on my face. I suppose I'm not a properly constructed damsel at all. I was down to see Little Dog Monday today. He has grown quite stiff and rheumatic, but there he sat, waiting for the train. He thumped his tail and looked pleadingly into my eyes. When will Jem come? he seemed to say. Oh, Dog Monday. There is no answer to that question. 
and there is as yet no answer to the others which we are all constantly asking. What will happen when Germany strikes again on the Western Front, her one great last blow for victory? 1st March, 1918 What will spring bring? Gertrude said today. I dread it as I never dreaded spring before. Do you suppose there will ever again come a time when life will be free from fear? For almost four years we have lain down with fear and risen up with it. It has been the unbidden guest at every meal, the unwelcome companion at every gathering. Hindenburg says he will be in Paris on 1st April, sighed Cousin Sophia. Hindenburg! There is no power in pen and ink to express the contempt which Susan infused into that name. Has he forgotten what day the 1st of April is? Hindenburg has kept his word hitherto, said Gertrude, as gloomily as Cousin Sophia herself could have said it. Yes, fighting against the Russians and Romanians, retorted Susan. Wait you till he comes up against the British and French, not to speak of the Yankees, who are getting there as fast as they can, and will no doubt give a good account of themselves. You said just the same thing before Mons, Susan, I reminded her. Hindenburg says he will spend a million lives to break the Allied front, said Gertrude. At such a price he must purchase some successes, and how can we live through them, even if he is baffled in the end? These past two months, when we have been crouching and waiting for the blow to fall, have seemed as long as all the preceding months of the war put together. I work all day feverishly and waken at three o'clock at night to wonder if the Iron Legions have struck at last. It is then I see Hindenburg in Paris, and Germany triumphant. I never see her so at any other time than that accursed hour. Susan looked dubious over Gertrude's adjective, but evidently concluded that the A saved the situation. I wish it were possible to take some magic draught and go to sleep for the next three months, and then waken to find Armageddon over," said Mother, almost impatiently. It is not often that Mother slumps into a wish like that, or at least the verbal expression of it. Mother has changed a great deal since that terrible day in September when we knew that Walter would not come back, but she has always been brave and patient. Now it seemed as if even she had reached the limit of her endurance. Susan went over to Mother and touched her shoulder. "'Do not you be frightened or downhearted, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said gently. "'I felt somewhat that way myself last night, and I rose from my bed and lighted my lamp and opened my Bible. And what do you think was the first verse my eyes lighted upon? It was, "'And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord of hosts, to deliver thee. I am not gifted in the way of dreaming, as Miss Oliver is. But I knew then and there, Mrs. Dr. dear, that it was a manifest leading, and that Hindenburg will never see Paris.' So I read no further, but went back to my bed, and I did not waken at three o'clock or any other hour before morning. I say that verse Susan read over and over again to myself. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the spirits of all just men made perfect, and even the legions and guns that Germany is massing on the western front must break against such a barrier. This is in certain uplifted moments. But when other moments come I feel, like Gertrude, that I cannot endure any longer this awful and ominous hush before the coming storm. 23rd March, 1918. Armageddon has begun. The last great fight of all. Is it, I wonder? Yesterday I went down to the post office for the mail. It was a dull, bitter day. The snow has gone, but the grey, lifeless ground was frozen hard, and a biting wind was blowing. The whole Glen landscape was ugly and hopeless. Then I got the paper with its big black headlines. Germany struck on the 21st. She makes big claims of guns and prisoners taken. General Haig reports that severe fighting continues. I don't like the sound of that last expression. We all find we cannot do any work that requires concentration of thought, so we all knit furiously because we can do that mechanically. At least the dreadful waiting is over, the horrible wondering where and when the blow will fall. It has fallen. But they shall not prevail against us. Oh, what is happening on the Western Front tonight as I write this, sitting here in my room with my journal before me? Jim's is asleep in his crib, and the wind is wailing around the window. Over my desk hangs Walter's picture, looking at me with his beautiful deep eyes. The Mona Lisa he gave me the last Christmas he was home hangs on one side of it, and on the other a framed copy of the Piper. It seems to me that I can hear Walter's voice repeating it, that little poem into which he put his soul, and which will therefore live forever, carrying Walter's name on through the future of our land. Everything about me is calm and peaceful and homey. Walter seems very near me. If I could just sweep aside the thin, wavering little veil that hangs between, I could see him, just as he saw the Pied Piper the night before Corselet. Over there in France tonight, does the line hold? End of chapter 27
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapters 28 through 30. Chapter 28 Black Sunday. In March of the year of grace, 1918, there was one week into which must have crowded more of searing human agony than any seven days had ever held before in the history of the world. And in that week there was one day when all humanity seemed nailed to the cross. On that day the whole planet must have been a groan with universal convulsion. Everywhere the hearts of men were failing them for fear. It dawned calmly and coldly and grayly at Ingleside. Mrs. Blythe and Rilla and Miss Oliver made ready for church in a suspense tempered by hope and confidence. The doctor was away, having been summoned during the wee smas to the Marwood household in Upper Glen, where a little war-bride was fighting gallantly on her own battleground to give life, not death, to the world. Susan announced that she meant to stay home that morning, a rare decision for Susan. "'But I would rather not go to church this morning, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she explained. If Whiskers on the Moon were there, and I saw him looking holy and pleased, as he always looks when he thinks the Huns are winning, I fear I would lose my patience and my sense of decorum and hurl a Bible or hymn-book at him, thereby disgracing myself and the sacred edifice. No, Mrs. Dr. dear, I shall stay home from church till the tide turns and pray hard here. I think I might as well stay home, too, for all the good church will do me today, Miss Oliver said to Rilla, as they walked down the hard-frozen red road to the church. I can think of nothing but the question, does the line still hold? Next Sunday will be Easter, said Rilla. Will it herald death or life to our cause? Mr. Meredith preached that morning from the text, He that endureth to the end shall be saved, and hope and confidence rang through his inspiring sentences. Rilla, looking up at the memorial tablet on the wall above their pew, sacred to the memory of Walter Cuthbert Blythe, felt herself lifted out of her dread, and filled anew with courage. Walter could not have laid down his life for naught. His had been the gift of prophetic vision, and he had foreseen victory. She would cling to that belief. The line would hold. In this renewed mood she walked home from church almost gaily. The others, too, were hopeful, and all went smiling into Ingleside. There was no one in the living-room save Jims, who had fallen asleep on the sofa, and Doc, who sat hushed in grim repose on the hearth-rug, looking very hydish indeed. No one was in the dining-room either and stranger still, no dinner was on the table, which was not even set. Where was Susan? "'Can she have taken ill?' exclaimed Mrs. Blythe anxiously. "'I thought it strange that she did not want to go to church this morning.' The kitchen door opened, and Susan appeared on the threshold with such a ghastly face that Mrs. Blythe cried out in sudden panic, "'Susan, what is it?' "'The British line is broken, and the German shells are falling on Paris,' said Susan dully. The three women stared at each other, stricken. "'It's not true. It's not.' gasped Rilla. "'The thing would be ridiculous,' said Gertrude Oliver, and then she laughed horribly. "'Susan, who told you this? When did the news come?' asked Mrs. Blythe. "'I got it over the long-distance phone from Charlottetown half an hour ago,' said Susan. "'The news came to town late last night. It was Dr. Holland phoned it out, and he said it was only too true. Since then I have done nothing, Mrs. Dr. dear. I am very sorry dinner is not ready. It is the first time I have been so remiss.' If you will be patient, I will soon have something for you to eat. But I am afraid I let the potatoes burn. Dinner? Nobody wants any dinner, Susan, said Mrs. Blythe wildly. Oh, this thing is unbelievable. It must be a nightmare. Paris is lost. France is lost. The war is lost, gasped Perilla, amid the utter ruins of hope and confidence and belief. Oh, God, oh, God, moaned Gertrude Oliver, walking about the room and wringing her hands. Oh, God! Nothing else. No other words, nothing but that age-old plea, the old, old cry of supreme agony and appeal, from the human heart whose every human staff has failed it. "'Is God dead?' asked a startled little voice from the doorway of the living-room. Jim stood there, flushed from sleep, his big brown eyes filled with dread. "'Oh, Willa! Oh, Willa! Is God dead?' Miss Oliver stopped walking and exclaiming, and stared at Jim's, in whose eyes tears of fright were beginning to gather. Rilla ran to his comforting, while Susan bounded up from the chair upon which she had dropped. "'No,' she said briskly, with a sudden return of her real self. "'No, God isn't dead, nor Lloyd George either. We were forgetting that, Mrs. Dr. dear. Don't cry, little Kitchener. Bad as things are, they might be worse. The British line may have broken, but the British Navy is not. Let us tie to that. 
I will take a brace and get up a bite to eat, for strength we must have. They made a pretense of eating Susan's bite, but it was only a pretense. Nobody at Ingleside ever forgot that black afternoon. Gertrude Oliver walked the floor. They all walked the floor, except Susan, who got out her grey war sock. Mrs. Dr. dear, I must knit on Sunday at last. I have never dreamed of doing it before, for say what might be said, I have considered it was a violation of the third commandment. But whether it is or whether it is not, I must knit to-day or I shall go mad. Knit if you can, Susan, said Mrs. Blythe restlessly. I would knit if I could, but I cannot. I cannot. If we could only get fuller information, moaned Rilla, there might be something to encourage us if we knew all. We know that the Germans are shelling Paris, said Miss Oliver bitterly. In that case they must have smashed through everywhere and be at the very gates. No, we have lost. Let us face the fact as other peoples in the past have had to face it. Other nations, with right on their side, have given their best and bravest, and gone down to defeat in spite of it. Ours is but one more to baffled millions who have gone before. I won't give up like that, cried Rilla, her pale face suddenly flushing. I won't despair. We are not conquered. No, if Germany overruns all France, we are not conquered. I am ashamed of myself for this hour of despair. You won't see me slump again like that. I am going to ring up town at once and ask for particulars." But town could not be got. The long-distance operator there was submerged by similar calls from every part of the distracted country. Rilla finally gave up and slipped away to Rainbow Valley. There she knelt down on the withered grey grasses in the little nook where she and Walter had had their last talk together, with her head bowed against the mossy trunk of a fallen tree. The sun had broken through the black clouds and drenched the valley with a pale golden splendour. The bells on the tree-lovers twinkled elfinly and fitfully in the gusty March wind. "'Oh, God, give me strength,' she whispered. "'Just strength and courage.' Then, like a child, she clasped her hands together and said, as simply as Jim's could have done, "'Please send us better news to-morrow.' She knelt there a long time, and when she went back to Ingleside she was calm and resolute. The doctor had arrived home, tired but triumphant, little Douglas Haig Marwood having made a safe landing on the shores of time. Gertrude was still pacing restlessly, but Mrs. Blythe and Susan had reacted from the shock, and Susan was already planning a new line of defence for their channel ports. "'As long as we can hold them,' she declared, "'the situation is saved. Paris has really no military significance.' "'Don't,' said Gertrude sharply, as if Susan had run something into her. She thought the old worn phrase, no military significance, nothing short of ghastly mockery under the circumstances, and more terrible to endure than the voice of despair would have been. I heard up at Marwood's of the line being broken, said the doctor, but this story of the Germans shelling Paris seems to be rather incredible. Even if they broke through, they were fifty miles from Paris at the nearest point, and how could they get their artillery close enough to shell it in so short a time? Depend upon it, girls, that part of the message can't be true. I'm going to try a long-distance call to town myself. The doctor was no more successful than Rilla had been, but his point of view cheered them all a little, and helped them through the evening. At nine o'clock a long-distance message came through at last that helped them through the night. "'The line broke only in one place before St. Quentin,' said the doctor as he hung up the receiver, "'and the British troops are retreating in good order. That's not so bad. As for the shells that are falling on Paris, they are coming from a distance of seventy miles, from some amazing long-range gun the Germans have invented, and sprung with the opening offensive. That is all the news to date, and Dr. Holland says it is reliable.' "'It would have been dreadful news yesterday,' said Gertrude but compared to what we heard this morning it is almost like good news. But still," she added, trying to smile, I am afraid I will not sleep much to-night. There is one thing to be thankful for at any rate, Miss Oliver, dear," said Susan, and that is that Cousin Sophia did not come in to-day. I really could not have endured her on top of all the rest. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 Wounded and Missing Battered but not broken was the headline in Monday's paper, and Susan repeated it over and over to herself as she went about her work. The gap caused by the St. Quentin disaster had been patched up in time, but the Allied line was being pushed relentlessly back from the territory they had purchased in 1917 with half a million lives. On Wednesday the headline was, British and French Czech Germans, but still the retreat went on. Back and back and back. Where would it end? Would the line break again, this time disastrously? On Saturday the headline was, Even Berlin Admits Offensive Checked, and for the first time in that terrible week the Ingleside folk dare to draw a long breath. "'Well, we have got one week over. Now for the next,' said Susan staunchly. 
"'I feel like a prisoner on the rack when they stop turning it,' Miss Oliver said to Rilla as they went to church on Easter morning. "'But I am not off the rack. The torture may begin again at any time.' "'I doubted God last Sunday,' said Rilla. "'But I don't doubt him today. Evil cannot win. Spirit is on our side, and it is bound to outlast flesh.' Nevertheless, her faith was often tried in the dark spring that followed. Armageddon was not, as they had hoped, a matter of a few days. It stretched out into weeks and months. Again and again Hindenburg struck his savage, sudden blows with alarming though futile success. Again and again the military critics declared the situation extremely perilous. Again and again Cousin Sophia agreed with the military critics. "'If the Allies go back three miles more, the war is lost,' she wailed. "'Is the British Navy anchored in those three miles?' demanded Susan scornfully. "'It is the opinion of a man who knows all about it,' said Cousin Sophia solemnly. "'There is no such person,' retorted Susan. "'As for the military critics, they do not know one blessed thing about it any more than you or I. They have been mistaken times out of number. Why do you always look on the dark side, Sophia Crawford?' "'Because there ain't any bright side, Susan Baker. Oh, is there not?' It is the 20th of April, and Hindi is not in Paris yet, although he said he would be there by April 1st. Is that not a bright spot, at least? It is my opinion that the Germans will be in Paris before very long, and more than that, Susan Baker, they will be in Canada. Not in this part of it. The Huns shall never set foot in Prince Edward Island as long as I can handle a pitchfork, declared Susan, looking and feeling quite equal to routing the entire German army single-handed. "'No, Sophia Crawford. To tell you the plain truth, I am sick and tired of your gloomy predictions. I do not deny that some mistakes have been made. The Germans would never have got back Passchendaele if the Canadians had been left there, and it was bad business trusting to those Portuguese at the Lys River. But that is no reason why you or anyone should go about proclaiming the war is lost. I do not want to quarrel with you, least of all at such a time as this, but our morale must be kept up.' and I am going to speak my mind out plainly, and tell you that if you cannot keep from such croaking, your room is better than your company. Cousin Sophia marched home in high dudgeon to digest her affront, and did not reappear in Susan's kitchen for many weeks. Perhaps it was just as well, for they were hard weeks, when the Germans continued to strike, now here, now there, and seemingly vital points fell to them at every blow. And one day in early May, when wind and sunshine frolicked in Rainbow Valley, and the maple grove was golden green, and the harbour all blue and dimpled and white-capped, the news came about Jem. There had been a trench raid on the Canadian front, a little trench raid so insignificant that it was never even mentioned in the dispatches, and when it was over, Lieutenant James Blythe was reported wounded and missing. "'I think this is even worse than the news of his death would have been,' moaned Rilla through her white lips that night. "'No!' "'No, missing leaves a little hope, Rilla,' urged Gertrude Oliver. "'Yes, torturing, agonized hope that keeps you from ever becoming quite resigned to the worst,' said Rilla. "'Oh, Miss Oliver, must we go for weeks and months not knowing whether Jem is alive or dead? Perhaps we will never know. I—I I cannot bear it. I cannot. Walter, and now Jem. This will kill Mother. Look at her face, Miss Oliver, and you will see that. And Faith, poor Faith, how can she bear it?' Gertrude shivered with pain. She looked up at the pictures hanging over Rilla's desk and felt a sudden hatred of Mona Lisa's endless smile. "'Well, not even this blotted off your face,' she thought savagely. But she said gently, "'No. It will not kill your mother. She's made of finer metal than that. Besides, she refuses to believe Jem is dead. She will cling to hope, and we must all do that. Faith, you may be sure, will do it.' "'I cannot,' moaned Rilla. "'Jem was wounded.' What chance would he have? Even if the Germans found him, we know how they have treated wounded prisoners. I wish I could hope, Miss Oliver. It would help, I suppose. But hope seems dead in me. I can't hope without some reason for it, and there is no reason. When Miss Oliver had gone to her own room and Rilla was lying on her bed in the moonlight, praying desperately for a little strength, Susan stepped in like a gaunt shadow and sat down beside her. Rilla, dear, do not you worry. Little Jem is not dead. Oh, how can you believe that, Susan? Because I know. Listen you to me. When that word came this morning, the first thing I thought of was Dog Monday. And tonight, as soon as I got the supper dishes washed and the bread set, I went down to the station. There was Dog Monday, waiting for the train, just as patient as usual. Now, Rilla, dear, that trench raid was four days ago, last Monday, and I said to the station agent, 
Can you tell me if that dog howled or made any kind of a fuss last Monday night? He thought it over a bit, and then he said, No, he did not. Are you sure? I said. There's more depends on it than you think. Dead sure, he said. I was up all night last Monday night because my mare was sick, and there was never a sound out of him. I would have heard if there had been, for the stable door was open all the time, and his kennel is right across from it. Now, Rilla dear, those were the man's very words, and you know how that poor little dog howled all night after the Battle of Corselet. Yet he did not love Walter as much as he loved Jem. If he mourned for Walter like that, do you suppose he would sleep sound in his kennel the night after Jem had been killed? No, Rilla dear. Little Jem is not dead, and that you may tie to. If he were, Dog Monday would have known, just as he knew before, and he would not still be waiting for the trains. It was absurd, and irrational, and impossible. But Rilla believed it for all that, and Mrs. Blythe believed it. And the doctor, though he smiled faintly in pretended derision, felt an odd confidence replace his first despair. And foolish and absurd or not, they all plucked up heart and courage to carry on, just because a faithful little dog at the Glen station was still watching with unbroken faith for his master to come home. Common sense might scorn, incredulity might mutter mere superstition, but in their hearts the folk of Ingleside stood by their belief that Dog Monday knew. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 The Turning of the Tide Susan was very sorrowful when she saw the beautiful old lawn of Ingleside ploughed up that spring and planted with potatoes. Yet she made no protest, even when her beloved peony bed was sacrificed. But when the government passed the daylight saving law, Susan balked. There was a higher power than the Union government, to which Susan owed allegiance. "'Do you think it right to meddle with the arrangements of the Almighty?' she demanded indignantly of the doctor. The doctor, quite unmoved, responded that the law must be observed, and the Ingleside clocks were moved on accordingly. But the doctor had no power over Susan's little alarm. "'I bought that with my own money, Mrs. Dr. Dear,' she said firmly, "'and it shall go on God's time and not Borden's time.' Susan got up and went to bed by God's time, and regulated her own goings and comings by it. She served the meals under protest by Borden's time, and she had to go to church by it, which was the crowning injury. But she said her prayers by her own clock, and fed the hens by it, so that there was always a furtive triumph in her eye when she looked at the doctor. She had got the better of him by so much at least. "'Whiskers on the moon is very much delighted with this daylight saving business,' she told him one evening. "'Of course he naturally would be, since I understand that the Germans invented it. I hear he came near losing his entire wheat crop lately. Warren Mead's cows broke into the field one day last week. It was the very day the Germans captured the Chemin de Dame, which may have been a coincidence, or may not, and were making a fine havoc of it when Mrs. Dick Clough happened to see them from her attic window. At first she had no intention of letting Mr. Pryor know. She told me she had just gloated over the sight of those cows pasturing on his wheat. She felt it served him exactly right. But presently she reflected that the wheat crop was a matter of great importance, and that save and serve meant that those cows must be routed out as much as it meant anything. So she went down and phoned over to Whiskers about the matter. All the thanks she got was that he said something queer right out to her. She is not prepared to state that it was actually swearing, for you cannot be sure just what you hear over the phone. But she has her own opinion, and so have I. But I will not express it, for here comes Mr. Meredith, and Whiskers is one of his elders, so we must be discreet. "'Are you looking for the new star?' asked Mr. Meredith, joining Miss Oliver and Rilla, who were standing among the blossoming potatoes, gazing skyward. "'Yes, we have found it. See, it is just above the tip of the tallest old pine.' "'It's wonderful to be looking at something that happened three thousand years ago, isn't it?' said Rilla. "'That is when astronomers think the collision took place which produced this new star. It makes me feel horribly insignificant,' she added under her breath. Even this event cannot dwarf into what may be the proper perspective in star systems the fact that the Germans are again only one leap from Paris," said Gertrude restlessly. "'I think I would like to have been an astronomer,' said Mr. Meredith dreamily, gazing at the star. "'There must be a strange pleasure in it,' agreed Miss Oliver, "'an unearthly pleasure in more senses than one. I would like to have a few astronomers for my friends.' "'Fancy talking the gossip of the hosts of heaven,' laughed Rilla. "'I wonder if astronomers feel a very deep interest in earthly affairs,' asked the doctor. "'Perhaps students of the canals of Mars would not be so keenly sensitive to the significance of a few yards of trenches lost or won on the western front.' "'I have read somewhere,' said Mr. Meredith, "'that Ernest Renan wrote one of his books during the siege of Paris in 1870, and enjoyed the writing of it very much. I suppose one would call him a philosopher.' "'I have read also,' said Miss Oliver, 
that shortly before his death he said that his only regret in dying was that he must die before he had seen what that extremely interesting young man, the great emperor, would do in his life. If Ernest Renan walked to-day and saw what that interesting young man had done to his beloved France, not to speak of the world, I wonder if his mental detachment would be as complete as it was in 1870. I wonder where Jem is to-night, thought Rilla, in a sudden bitter inrush of remembrance. It was over a month since the news had come about Jem. Nothing had been discovered concerning him, in spite of all efforts. Two or three letters had come from him, written before the trench raid, and since then there had been only unbroken silence. Now the Germans were again at the Marne, pressing nearer and nearer Paris. Now rumours were coming of another Austrian offensive against the Piave line. Rilla turned away from the new star, sick at heart. It was one of the moments when hope and courage failed her utterly, when it seemed impossible to go on even one more day. If only they knew what had happened to Jem! You can face anything you know. But a beleaguerment of fear and doubt and suspense is a hard thing for the morale. Surely, if Jem were alive, some word would have come through. He must be dead. Only, they would never know. They could never be quite sure. And Dog Monday would wait for the train until he died of old age. Monday was only a poor, faithful, rheumatic little dog who knew nothing more of his master's fate than they did. Rilla had a white night and did not fall asleep until late. When she wakened, Gertrude Oliver was sitting at her window, leaning out to meet the silver mystery of the dawn. Her clever, striking profile, with the masses of black hair behind it, came out clearly against the pallid gold of the eastern sky. Rilla remembered Jem's admiration of the curve of Miss Oliver's brow and chin, and she shuddered. Everything that reminded her of Jem was beginning to give intolerable pain. Walter's death had inflicted on her heart a terrible wound, but it had been a clean wound, and it healed slowly, as such wounds do, though the scar must remain forever. But the torture of Jem's disappearance was another thing. There was a poison in it that kept it from healing. The alternations of hope and despair, the endless watching each day for the letter that never came, that might never come, the newspaper tales of ill-usage of prisoners, the bitter wonder as to Jem's wound, all were increasingly hard to bear. Gertrude Oliver turned her head. There was an odd brilliancy in her eyes. "'Rilla, I've had another dream.' "'Oh, no, no!' cried Rilla, shrinking. Miss Oliver's dreams had always foretold coming disaster. "'Rilla, it was a good dream. Listen. I dreamed just as I did four years ago, that I stood on the veranda steps and looked down the glen. And it was still covered by waves that lapped about my feet. But as I looked, the waves began to ebb, and they ebbed as swiftly as four years ago they rolled in, ebbed out and out to the gulf, and the glen lay before me, beautiful and green, with a rainbow spanning Rainbow Valley a rainbow of such splendid color that it dazzled me, and I woke. Rilla! Rilla Blythe! The tide has turned. I wish I could believe it, sighed Rilla. Sooth was my prophecy of fear, believe it when it augurs cheer, quoted Gertrude almost gaily. I tell you, I have no doubt. Yet in spite of the great Italian victory at the Piaf that came a few days later, she had doubt many a time in the hard month that followed. And when, in mid-July, the Germans crossed the Marne again, despair came sickeningly. It was idle, they all felt, to hope that the miracle of the Marne would be repeated. But it was. Again, as in 1914, the tide turned at the Marne. The French and the American troops struck their sudden, smashing blow on the exposed flank of the enemy, and with the almost inconceivable rapidity of a dream, the whole aspect of the war changed. "'The Allies have won two tremendous victories,' said the doctor on 20th July. "'It is the beginning of the end. I feel it. I feel it,' said Mrs. Blythe. "'Thank God,' said Susan, folding her trembling old hands. Then she added under her breath, "'But it won't bring our boys back.' Nevertheless she went out and ran up the flag, for the first time since the fall of Jerusalem. As it caught the breeze and swelled gallantly out above her, Susan lifted her hand and saluted it, as she had seen Shirley do. "'We've all given something to keep you flying,' she said. Four hundred thousand of our boys gone overseas.' fifty thousand of them killed. But you are worth it." The wind whipped her grey hair about her face, and the gingham apron that shrouded her from head to foot was cut on lines of economy, not of grace. Yet somehow, just then, Susan made an imposing figure. She was one of the women, courageous, unquailing, patient, heroic, who had made victory possible. In her they all saluted the symbol for which their dearest had fought. Something of this was in the doctor's mind as he watched her from the door. Susan he said, when she turned to come in. From first to last of this business you have been a brick. End of chapter 30 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 31 Mrs. Matilda Pittman. Rilla and Jims were standing on the rear platform of their car when the train stopped at the little millward siding. The August evening was so hot and close that the crowded cars were stifling. Nobody ever knew just why trains stopped at Millward Siding. Nobody was ever known to get off there or get on. There was only one house nearer to it than four miles, and it was surrounded by acres of blueberry barrens and scrub spruce trees. Rilla was on her way into Charlottetown to spend the night with a friend, and the next day in Red Cross shopping. She had taken Jims with her, partly because she did not want Susan or her mother to be bothered with his care partly because of a hungry desire in her heart to have as much of him as she could before she might have to give him up for ever. James Anderson had written to her not long before this. He was wounded and in the hospital. He would not be able to go back to the front, and as soon as he was able he would be coming home for Jims. Rilla was heavy-hearted over this, and worried also. She loved Jims dearly and would feel deeply giving him up in any case. But if Jim Anderson were a different sort of a man, with a proper home for the child, it would not be so bad. But to give Jims up to a roving, shiftless, irresponsible father, however kind and good-hearted he might be—and she knew Jim Anderson was kind and good-hearted enough—was a bitter prospect to Rilla. It was not even likely Anderson would stay in the Glen. He had no ties there now. He might even go back to England. She might never see her dear, sunshiny, carefully brought-up little Jims again. With such a father, what might his fate be? Rilla meant to beg Jim Anderson to leave him with her, but, from his letter, she had not much hope that he would. "'If he would only stay in the Glen, where I could keep an eye on Jims and have him often with me, I wouldn't feel so worried over it,' she reflected. "'But I feel sure he won't, and Jims will never have any chance. And he's such a bright little chap. He has ambition, wherever he got it. And he isn't lazy. But his father will never have a cent to give him any education or start in life. Jims, my little war baby, whatever is going to become of you?' Jims was not in the least concerned over what was to become of him. He was gleefully watching the antics of a striped chipmunk that was frisking over the roof of the little siding. As the train pulled out, Jims leaned eagerly forward for a last look at Chippy, pulling his hand from Rilla's. Rilla was so engrossed in wondering what was to become of Jim in the future that she forgot to take notice of what was happening to him in the present. What did happen was that Jims lost his balance, shot headlong down the steps, hurtled across the little siding platform, and landed in a clump of bracken fern on the other side. Rilla shrieked and lost her head. She sprang down the steps and jumped off the train. Fortunately, the train was still going at a comparatively slow speed. Fortunately, also, Rilla retained enough sense to jump the way it was going. Nevertheless, she fell and sprawled helplessly down the embankment, landing in a ditch full of a rank growth of goldenrod and fireweed. Nobody had seen what had happened, and the train whisked briskly away round a curve in the barrens. Rilla picked herself up, dizzy but unhurt, scrambled out of the ditch and flew wildly across the platform, expecting to find Jims dead or broken in pieces. But Jims, except for a few bruises and a big fright, was quite uninjured. He was so badly scared that he didn't even cry, but Rilla, when she found that he was safe and sound, burst into tears and sobbed wildly. "'Nasty old twain,' remarked Jims in disgust. "'And that's the old god,' he added, with a scowl at the heavens. A laugh broke into Rilla's sobbing, producing something very like what her father would have called hysterics. But she caught herself up before the hysteria could conquer her. "'Rilla Blythe, I'm ashamed of you. Pull yourself together immediately. Jims, you shouldn't have said anything like that.' "'God threw me off the twain,' declared Jims defiantly. "'Somebody threw me. You didn't throw me, so it was God.' "'No, it wasn't.' You fell because you let go of my hand and bent too far forward. I told you not to do that, so it was your own fault." Jims looked to see if she meant it, then glanced up at the sky again. "'Excuse me, then, God,' he remarked airily. Rilla scanned the sky also. She did not like its appearance. A heavy thundercloud was appearing in the northwest. What in the world was to be done? There was no other train that night, since the nine o'clock special ran only on Saturdays. Would it be possible for them to reach Hannah Brewster's house two miles away before the storm broke? Rilla thought she could do it alone easily enough, but with Jim's it was another matter. Were his little legs good for it? "'We've got to try it,' said Rilla desperately. 
We might stay in the siding until the thunderstorm is over, but it may keep on raining all night, and anyway it'll be pitch dark. If we can get to Hannah's, she will keep us all night. Hannah Brewster, when she had been Hannah Crawford, had lived in the Glen and gone to school with Rilla. They had been good friends then, though Hannah had been three years the older. She had married very young and had gone to live in Millward. What with hard work and babies and a ne'er-do-well husband, her life had not been an easy one, and Hannah seldom revisited her old home. Rilla had visited her once soon after her marriage, but had not seen her or even heard of her for years. She knew, however, that she and Jims would find welcome in Harbridge in any house where rosy-faced, open-hearted, generous Hannah lived. For the first mile they got on very well, but the second one was harder. The road, seldom used, was rough and deep-rutted. Jims grew so tired that Rilla had to carry him for the last quarter. She reached the Brewster house, almost exhausted, and dropped Jims on the walk with a sigh of thankfulness. The sky was black with clouds. The first heavy drops were beginning to fall, and the rumble of thunder was growing very loud. Then she made an unpleasant discovery. The blinds were all down and the doors locked. Evidently the Brewsters were not at home. Rilla ran to the little barn. It, too, was locked. No other refuge presented itself. The bare, whitewashed little house had not even a veranda or porch. It was almost dark now, and her plight seemed desperate. "'I'm going to get in if I have to break a window,' said Rilla resolutely. "'Hannah would want me to do that. She'd never get over it if she heard I came to her house for refuge in a thunderstorm and couldn't get in.' Luckily she did not have to go to the length of actual housebreaking. The kitchen window went up quite easily. Rilla lifted Jims in and scrambled through herself, just as the storm broke in good earnest. "'Oh, see all the little pieces of thunder!' cried Jims in delight as the hail danced in after them. Rilla shut the window and, with some difficulty, found and lighted a lamp. They were in a very snug little kitchen. Opening off it on one side was a trim, nicely furnished parlour, and on the other a pantry, which proved to be well stocked. "'I'm going to make myself at home,' said Rilla. "'I know that is just what Hannah would want me to do. I'll get a little snack for Jims and me, and then, if the rain continues and nobody comes home, I'll just go upstairs to the spare room and go to bed. There's nothing like acting sensibly in an emergency. If I had not been a goose when I saw Jims fall off the train, I'd have rushed back into the car and got someone to stop it. Then I wouldn't have been in this scrape. Since I am in it, I'll make the best of it. This house, she added, looking around, is fixed up much nicer than when I was here before. Of course, Hannah and Ted were just beginning housekeeping then, but somehow I've had the idea that Ted hasn't been very prosperous. He must have done better than I've been led to believe when they can afford furniture like this. I'm awfully glad for Hannah's sake. The thunderstorm passed, but the rain continued to fall heavily. At eleven o'clock Rilla decided that nobody was coming home. Jims had fallen asleep on the sofa. She carried him up to the spare room and put him to bed. Then she undressed, put on a nightgown she found in the washstand drawer, and scrambled sleepily in between the very nice lavender-scented sheets. She was so tired after her adventures and exertions that not even the oddity of her situation could keep her awake. She was sound asleep in a few minutes. Rilla slept until eight o'clock the next morning, and then wakened with startling suddenness. Somebody was saying in a harsh, gruff voice, "'Here, you two, wake up. I want to know what this means.' Rilla did wake up, promptly and effectually. She had never in all her life wakened up so thoroughly before. Standing in the room were three people, one of them a man, who were absolute strangers to her. The man was a big fellow with a bushy black beard and an angry scowl. Beside him was a woman, a tall, thin, angular person, with violently red hair and an indescribable hat. She looked even crosser and more amazed than the man, if that were possible. In the background was another woman, a tiny old lady who must have been at least eighty. She was, in spite of her tininess, a very striking-looking personage. She was dressed in unrelieved black, had snow-white hair, a dead-white face, and snapping, vivid, coal-black eyes. She looked as amazed as the other two, but Rilla realized that she didn't look cross. Rilla also was realizing that something was wrong, fearfully wrong. Then the man said, more gruffly than ever, "'Come now! Who are you, and what business have you here?' Rilla raised herself on one elbow, looking and feeling hopelessly bewildered and foolish. She heard the old black-and-white lady in the background chuckle to herself. She must be real, Rilla thought. I can't be dreaming her. Aloud, she gasped, Isn't this Theodore Brewster's place? No, said the big woman, speaking for the first time. This place belongs to us. We bought it from the Brewsters last fall. They moved to Greenvale. Our name is Chapley. Poor Rilla fell back on her pillow, quite overcome. I beg your pardon, she said. I, I thought the Brewsters lived here. Mrs. Brewster is a friend of mine. I am Rilla Blythe, Dr. Blythe's daughter from Glen St. Mary. I—I I was going to town with my—my 
my this little boy and he fell off the train and i jumped off after him and nobody knew of it i knew we couldn't get home last night and a storm was coming up so we came here and when we found nobody at home we we just got in through the window and and made ourselves at home so it seems said the woman sarcastically a likely story said the man we weren't born yesterday added the woman madam black and white didn't say anything but when the other two made their pretty speeches she doubled up in a silent convulsion of mirth shaking her head from side to side and beating the air with her hands rilla stung by the disagreeable attitude of the chapleys regained her self-possession and lost her temper she sat up in bed and said in her haughtiest voice i do not know when you were born or where but it must have been somewhere where very peculiar manners were taught if you will have the decency to leave my room er、uh, this room until i can get up and dress i shall not transgress upon your hospitality rilla was killingly sarcastic any longer and i shall pay you amply for the food we have eaten and the night's lodging i have taken the black and white apparition went through the motion of clapping her hands but not a sound did she make perhaps mr chapley was cowed by rilla's tone or perhaps he was appeased at the prospect of payment at all events he spoke more civilly well that's fair if you pay up it's all right she shall do no such thing as pay you said madam black and white in a surprisingly clear resolute authoritative tone of voice if you haven't got any shame for yourself robert chapley you've got a mother-in-law who can be ashamed for you no stranger shall be charged for room and lodging in any house where mrs matilda pitman lives remember that though i may have come down in the world i haven't quite forgot all decency for all that i knew you was a skinflint when amelia married you and you've made her as bad as yourself but mrs matilda pitman has been boss for a long time and mrs matilda pitman will remain boss here you robert chapley take yourself out of here and let that girl get dressed and you amelia go downstairs and cook a breakfast for her never in all her life had rilla seen anything like the abject meekness with which those two big people obeyed that might they went without word or look of protest as the door closed behind them mrs matilda pitman laughed silently and rocked from side to side in her merriment hain't it funny she said i mostly lets them run the length of their tether but sometimes i has to pull them up and then i does it with a jerk they don't dast aggravate me because i've got considerable hard cash and they're afraid i won't leave it all to them neither i will i'll leave em some but some i won't just to vex em i haven't made up my mind where i will leave it but i'll have to soon for at eighty a body is living on borrowed time now you can take your time about dressing my dear and i'll go down and keep them mean scallywags in order that's a handsome child you have there is he your brother no he's a little war baby i've been taking care of because his mother died and his father was overseas answered rilla in a subdued tone war baby huh <laughs> well i'd better skin out of here before he wakes up or he'll likely start crying children don't like me never did i can't recollect any youngster ever coming near me of its own accord never had any of my own amelia was my stepdaughter well it saved me a world of bother if kids don't like me i don't like them so that's an even score but that certainly is a handsome child jims chose this moment for waking up he opened his big brown eyes and looked at mrs matilda pitman unblinkingly then he sat up dimpled deliciously pointed to her and said solemnly to rilla pretty lady willa pretty lady mrs matilda pitman smiled even eighty odd is sometimes vulnerable in vanity i've heard that children and fools tell the truth she said i was used to compliments when i was young but they're scarcer when you get as far along as i am i haven't had one for years、It、tastes good i suppose now you monkey you wouldn't give me a kiss then jims did quite a surprising thing he was not a demonstrative youngster and was cherry with kisses even to the ingleside people but without a word he stood up in bed his plump little body encased only in his undershirt ran to the footboard flung his arms about mrs matilda pitman's neck and gave her a bear hug accompanied by three or four hearty ungrudging smacks jims protested rilla aghast at his liberty you leave him be ordered mrs matilda pitman setting her bonnet straight laws i like to see someone that isn't skeered o me everybody is you are though you're trying to hide it and why of course robert and amelia are because i make em skeered on purpose but folks always are no matter how civil i be to them are you going to keep this child i'm afraid not his father is coming home before long is he any good the father i mean well he's kind and nice but he's poor and i'm afraid he always will be faltered rilla i see shiftless can't make or keep well i'll see i'll see i have an idea it's a good idea and besides it'll make robert and amelia squirm that's its main merit in my eyes 
though I like that child, mind you, because he ain't scared of me. He's worth some bother. Now you get dressed, as I said before, and come down when you're good and ready. Rilla was stiff and sore after her tumble and walk of the night before, but she was not long in dressing herself and Jim's. When she went down to the kitchen she found a smoking hot breakfast on the table. Mr. Chapley was nowhere in sight, and Mrs. Chapley was cutting bread with a sulky air. Mrs. Matilda Pittman was sitting in an armchair, knitting a grey army sock. She still wore her bonnet and her triumphant expression. "'Set right in, dears, and make a good breakfast,' she said. "'I am not hungry,' said Willa, almost pleadingly. "'I don't think I can eat anything. And it is time I was starting for the station. The morning train will be along soon. Please excuse me and let us go. I'll take a piece of bread and butter for Jim's.' Mrs. Matilda Pittman shook a knitting-needle playfully at Rilla. "'Sit down and take your breakfast,' she said. "'Mrs. Matilda Pittman commands you. Everybody obeys Mrs. Matilda Pittman, even Robert and Amelia. You must obey her, too.' Rilla did obey her. She sat down, and such was the influence of Mrs. Matilda Pittman's mesmeric eye, she ate a tolerable breakfast. The obedient Amelia never spoke. Mrs. Matilda Pittman did not speak either, but she knitted furiously and chuckled. When Rilla had finished, Mrs. Matilda Pittman rolled up her sock. "'Now you can go if you want to,' she said. "'But you don't have to go. You can stay here as long as you want to, and I'll make Amelia cook your meals for you.' The independent Miss Blythe, whom a certain clique of junior Red Cross girls accused of being domineering and bossy, was thoroughly cowed. "'Thank you,' she said meekly. "'But we really must go.' "'Well, then,' said Mrs. Matilda Pittman, throwing open the door, "'your conveyance is ready for you. I told Robert he must hitch up and drive you to the station.' I enjoy making Robert do things. It's almost the only sport I have left. I'm over eighty, and most things have lost their flavour except bossing Robert." Robert sat before the door on the front seat of a trim, double-seated, rubber-tired buggy. He must have heard every word his mother-in-law said, but he gave no sign. "'I do wish,' said Rilla, plucking up what little spirit she had left, "'that you would let me—oh, uh—' Then she quailed again before Mrs. Matilda Pittman's eye. "'Recompense you for—for—' for, Mrs. Matilda Pittman said before, and she meant it, that she doesn't take pay for entertaining strangers, nor let other people where she lives do it, much as their natural meanness would like to do it. You go along to town, and don't forget to call the next time you come this way. Don't be scared. Not that you are scared of much, I reckon, considering the way you sassed Robert back this morning. I like your spunk. Most girls nowadays are such timid, skeery creatures. When I was a girl I wasn't afraid of nothing nor nobody. Mind you take good care of that boy. He ain't any common child. And make Robert drive round all the puddles in the road. I won't have that new buggy splashed." As they drove away, Jims threw kisses at Mrs. Matilda Pittman as long as he could see her, and Mrs. Matilda Pittman waved her sock back at him. Robert spoke no word, either good or bad, all the way back to the station, but he remembered the puddles. When Rilla got out at the siding she thanked him courteously. The only response she got was a grunt as Robert turned his horse and started for home. Well. Rilla drew a long breath. I must try to get back into Rilla Blythe again. I've been somebody else these past few hours. I don't know just who. Some creation of that extraordinary old person's. I believe she hypnotized me. What an adventure this will be to write the boys. And then she sighed. Bitter remembrance came that there were only Jerry, Ken, Carl, and Shirley to write it to now. Jem, who would have appreciated Mrs. Matilda Pittman keenly. Where was Jem? End of chapter 31 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 32. Word from Jem. 4th August 1918. It is four years tonight since the dance at the lighthouse. Four years of war. It seems like three times four. I was fifteen then. I am nineteen now. I expected that these past four years would be the most delightful years of my life, and they have been years of war, years of fear and grief and worry. But I humbly hope of a little growth in strength and character as well. Today I was going through the hall, and I heard Mother saying something to Father about me. I didn't mean to listen. I couldn't help hearing her as I went along the hall and upstairs. So perhaps that is why I heard what listeners are said never to hear something good of myself. And because it was Mother who said it, I'm going to write it here in my journal, for my comforting when days of discouragement come upon me, in which I feel that I am vain and selfish and weak, and that there is no good thing in me. Rilla has developed in a wonderful fashion these past four years. 
She used to be such an irresponsible young creature. She has changed into a capable, womanly girl, and she is such a comfort to me. Nan and Di have grown a little away from me. They have been so little at home. But Rilla has grown closer and closer to me. We are chums. I don't see how I could have got through these terrible years without her, Gilbert. There. That is just what Mother said. And I feel glad. And sorry. And proud. And humble. It's beautiful to have my mother think that about me. But I don't deserve it quite. I'm not as good and strong as all that. There are heaps of times when I have felt cross and impatient and woeful and despairing. It is Mother and Susan who have been this family's backbone. But I have helped a little, I believe. And I'm so glad and thankful. The war news has been good right along. The French and Americans are pushing the Germans back and back and back. Sometimes I am afraid it is too good to last. After nearly four years of disasters one has a feeling that this constant success is unbelievable. We don't rejoice noisily over it. Susan keeps the flag up, but we go softly. The price paid has been too high for jubilation. We are just thankful that it has not been paid in vain. No word has come from Jem. We hope, because we dare not do anything else. But there are hours when we all feel, though we never say so, that such hoping is foolishness. These hours come more and more frequently as the weeks go by, and we may never know. That is the most terrible thought of all. I wonder how Faith is bearing it. To judge from her letters, she has never for a moment given up hope, but she must have had her dark hours of doubt like the rest of us. 20th August, 1918 the Canadians have been in action again, and Mr. Meredith had a cable today saying that Carl had been slightly wounded and is in the hospital. It did not say where the wound was, which is unusual, and we all feel worried. There is news of a fresh victory every day now. 30th August, 1918. The Merediths had a letter from Carl today. His wound was only a slight one, but it was in his right eye, and the sight is gone forever. One eye is enough to watch bugs with, Carl writes cheerfully and we know it might have been, oh, so much worse, if it had been both eyes. But I cried all the afternoon after I saw Carl's letter, those beautiful, fearless blue eyes of his. There is one comfort. He will not have to go back to the front. He is coming home as soon as he is out of the hospital, the first of our boys to return. When will the others come? And there is one who will never come. At least we will not see him if he does. But, oh, I think he will be there. When our Canadian soldiers return, there will be a shadow army with them, the army of the fallen. We will not see them, but they will be there. 1st September, 1918 Mother and I went into Charlottetown yesterday to see the moving picture, Hearts of the World. I made an awful lose of myself. Father will never stop teasing me about it for the rest of my life. But it all seemed so horribly real, and I was so intensely interested that I forgot everything but the scenes I saw enacted before my eyes. And then, quite near the last, came a terribly exciting one. The heroine was struggling with a horrible German soldier who was trying to drag her away. I knew she had a knife. I had seen her hide it, to have it in readiness. And I couldn't understand why she didn't produce it and finish the brute. I thought she must have forgotten it. And just at the tensest moment of the scene, I lost my head altogether. I just stood right up on my feet in that crowded house and shrieked at the top of my voice, THE KNIFE IS IN YOUR STOCKING! THE KNIFE IS IN YOUR STOCKING! I created a sensation. The funny part was that just as I said it, the girl did snatch out the knife and stab the soldier with it. Everybody in the house laughed. I came to my senses and fell back in my seat, overcome with mortification. Mother was shaking with laughter. I could have shaken her. Why hadn't she pulled me down and choked me before I had made such an idiot of myself? She protests that there wasn't time. Fortunately, the house was dark, and I don't believe there was anybody there who knew me. And I thought I was becoming sensible and self-controlled and womanly. It is plain I have some distance to go yet before I attain that devoutly desired consummation. 20th September, 1918 In the East, Bulgaria has asked for peace, and in the West, the British have smashed the Hindenburg Line. And right here in Glen St. Mary, little Bruce Meredith has done something that I think wonderful, wonderful because of the love behind it. Mrs. Meredith was here tonight and told us about it, and Mother and I cried, and Susan got up and clattered the things about the stove. Bruce always loved Jem very devotedly, and the child has never forgotten him in all these years. He has been as faithful in his way as Dog Monday was in his. We have always told him that Jem would come back, but it seems that he was in Carter Flagg's store last night, and he heard his Uncle Norman flatly declaring that Jem Blythe would never come back, and that the Ingleside folk might as well give up hoping he would. Bruce went home and cried himself to sleep. 
This morning his mother saw him going out of the yard, with a very sorrowful and determined look, carrying his pet kitten. She didn't think much more about it until later on he came in, with a most tragic little face, and told her, his little body shaking with sobs, that he had drowned Stripey. "'Why did you do that?' Mrs. Meredith exclaimed. "'To bring Jem back,' sobbed Bruce. "'I thought that if I sacrificed Stripey, God would send Jem back, so I drowned him. And, oh, mother, it was awful hard. But surely God will send Jem back now, because Stripey was the dearest thing I had. I just told God I would give him Stripey if he would send Jem back. And he will, won't he, mother?' Mrs. Meredith didn't know what to say to the poor child. She just could not tell him that perhaps his sacrifice wouldn't bring Jem back, that God didn't work that way. She told him that he mustn't expect it right away, that perhaps it would be quite a long time yet before Jem came back. But Bruce said, "'It oughtn't to take longer in a week, mother. Oh, mother, Stripey was such a nice little cat. He purged so pretty. Don't you think God ought to like him enough to let us have Jem?' Mr. Meredith is worried about the effect on Bruce's faith in God, and Mrs. Meredith is worried about the effect on Bruce himself if his hope isn't fulfilled. And I feel as if I must cry every time I think of it. It was so splendid, and sad, and beautiful. The dear, devoted little fellow, he worshipped that kitten. And if it all goes for nothing, as so many sacrifices seem to go for nothing, he will be broken-hearted, for he isn't old enough to understand that God doesn't answer our prayers just as we hope and doesn't make bargains with us when we yield something we love up to him. 24th September, 1918 I have been kneeling at my window in the moonshine for a long time, just thanking God over and over again. The joy of last night and today has been so great that it seemed half pain, as if our hearts weren't big enough to hold it. Last night I was sitting here in my room at eleven o'clock, writing a letter to Shirley. Everyone else was in bed, except Father, who was out. I heard the telephone ring, and I ran out to the hall to answer it before it should awaken Mother. It was long-distance calling, and when I answered it said, "'This is the telegraph company's office in Charlottetown. There is an overseas cable for Dr. Blythe.' I thought of Shirley. My heart stood still. And then I heard him saying, "'It's from Holland.' The message was, "'Just arrived. Escaped from Germany. Quite well. Writing. James Blythe.' I didn't faint or fall or scream. I didn't feel glad or surprised. I didn't feel anything. I felt numb, just as I did when I heard Walter had enlisted. I hung up the receiver and turned round. Mother was standing in her doorway. She wore her old rose kimono, and her hair was hanging down her back in a long, thin braid, and her eyes were shining. She looked just like a young girl. "'There's word from Jem,' she said. How did she know? I hadn't said a word at the phone except yes, yes, yes. She says she doesn't know how she knew, but she did know. She was awake, and she heard the ring, and she knew that there was word from Jem. "'He's alive. He's well. He's in Holland,' I said. Mother came out into the hall and said, "'I must get your father on the phone and tell him. He's in the upper glen.' She was very calm and quiet, not a bit like I would have expected her to be. But then I wasn't either. I went and woke up Gertrude and Susan and told them. Susan said, "'Thank God,' firstly, and secondly she said, did I not tell you Dog Monday knew? And thirdly, I'll go down and make a cup of tea. And she stalked down in her nightdress to make it. She did make it, and made Mother and Gertrude drink it, but I went back to my room and shut my door and locked it. And I knelt by my window and cried, just as Gertrude did when her great news came. I think I know at last exactly what I shall feel like on the resurrection morning. 4th October, 1918. Today Jem's letter came. It has been in the house only six hours, and it is almost read to pieces. The postmistress told everybody in the glen it had come, and everybody came up to hear the news. Jem was badly wounded in the thigh, and he was picked up and taken to prison, so delirious with fever that he didn't know what was happening to him or where he was. It was weeks before he came to his senses and was able to write. Then he did write, but it never came. He wasn't treated at all badly at his camp, only the food was poor. He had nothing to eat but a little black bread and boiled turnips, and now and then a little soup with black peas in it and we sat down every one of those days to three good square luxurious meals. He wrote us as often as he could, but he was afraid we were not getting his letters, because no reply came. As soon as he was strong enough he tried to escape, but was caught and brought back. A month later he and a comrade made another attempt and succeeded in reaching Holland. Jem can't come home right away. He isn't quite so well as his cable said, for his wound has not healed properly, and he has to go into a hospital in England for further treatment. 
but he says he will be all right eventually, and we know he is safe and will come back home some time, and oh, the difference it makes in everything. I had a letter from Jim Anderson today, too. He has married an English girl, got his discharge, and is coming right home to Canada with his bride. I don't know whether to be glad or sorry. It will depend on what kind of a woman she is. I had a second letter also of a somewhat mysterious tenor. It is from a Charlottetown lawyer asking me to go in to see him at my earliest convenience in regard to a certain matter connected with the estate of the late Mrs. Matilda Pittman. I read a notice of Mrs. Pittman's death, from heart failure, in the Enterprise a few weeks ago. I wonder if this summons has anything to do with Jim's. 5th October, 1918 I went into town this morning and had an interview with Mrs. Pittman's lawyer, a little thin wispy man who spoke of his late client with such a profound respect that it is evident that he was as much under her thumb as Robert and Amelia were. He drew up a new will for her a short time before her death. She was worth thirty thousand dollars, the bulk of which was left to Amelia Chapley, but she left five thousand to me in trust for Jim's. The interest is to be used as I see fit for his education, and the principal is to be paid over to him on his twentieth birthday. Certainly Jim's was born lucky. I saved him from slow extinction at the hands of Mrs. Conover, Mary Vance saved him from death by diphtheric croup, his star saved him when he fell off the train, and he tumbled not only into a clump of bracken, but right into this nice little legacy. Evidently, as Mrs. Matilda Pittman said, and as I have always believed, he is no common child, and he has no common destiny in store for him. At all events, he is provided for, and in such a fashion that Jim Anderson can't squander his inheritance if he wanted to. Now, if the new English stepmother is only a good sort, I shall feel quite easy about the future of my war-baby. I wonder what Robert and Amelia think of it. I fancy they will nail down their windows when they leave home after this. End of chapter 32 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006 Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapters 33 and 34 Chapter 33 Victory A day of chilling winds and gloomy skies, Rilla quoted one Sunday afternoon, the 6th of October to be exact. It was so cold that they had lighted a fire in the living room, and the merry little flames were doing their best to counteract the outside dourness. It's more like November than October. November is such an ugly month. Cousin Sophia was there, having again forgiven Susan, and Mrs. Martin Clow, who was not visiting on Sunday, but had dropped in to borrow Susan's cure for rheumatism, that being cheaper than getting one from the doctor. "'I'm afeard we're going to have an early winter,' foreboded Cousin Sophia. "'The muskrats are building awful big houses round the pond, and that's a sign that never fails. "'Dear me, how that child has grown!' Cousin Sophia sighed again, as if it were an unhappy circumstance that a child should grow. "'When do you expect his father?' "'Next week,' said Rilla. "'Well, I hope the stepmother won't abuse the poor child,' sighed Cousin Sophia. "'But I have my doubts. I have my doubts. "'Anyhow, he'll be sure to feel the difference between his usage here and what he'll get anywhere else. "'You've spoiled him so, Rilla, waiting on him hand and foot the way you've always done.' Rilla smiled and pressed her cheek to Jim's curls. She knew sweet-tempered, sunny little Jim's was not spoiled. Nevertheless, her heart was anxious behind her smile. She, too, thought much about the new Mrs. Anderson, and wondered uneasily what she would be like. "'I can't give Jims up to a woman who won't love him,' she thought rebelliously. "'I believe it's going to rain,' said Cousin Sophia. "'We have had an awful lot of rain this fall already. It's going to make it awful hard for people to get their roots in. It wasn't so in my young days. We generally had beautiful Octobers then, but the seasons is altogether different now from what they used to be.' Clear across Cousin Sophia's doleful voice cut the telephone bell. Gertrude Oliver answered it. Yes? What? What? Is it true? Is it official? Thank you. Thank you. Gertrude turned and faced the room dramatically, her dark eyes flashing, her dark face flushed with feeling. All at once the sun broke through the thick clouds and poured through the big crimson maple outside the window. Its reflected glow enveloped her in a weird, immaterial flame. She looked like a priestess performing some mystic, splendid rite. "'Germany and Austria are suing for peace,' she said. Rilla went crazy for a few minutes. She sprang up and danced around the room, clapping her hands, laughing, crying. "'Sit down, child,' said Mrs. Clow, who never got excited over anything, and so had missed a tremendous amount of trouble and delight in her journey through life. 
Oh, cried Rilla, I have walked the floor for hours in despair and anxiety these past few years. Now let me walk in joy. It was worth living long, dreary years for this minute, and it would be worth living them again just to look back to it. Susan, let's run up the flag, and we must phone the news to everyone in the Glen. Can we have as much sugar as we want to now? asked Jims eagerly. It was a never to be forgotten afternoon. As the news spread, excited people ran about the village and dashed up to Ingleside. The Merediths came over and stayed to supper, and everybody talked and nobody listened. Cousin Sophia tried to protest that Germany and Austria were not to be trusted and that it was all part of a plot, but nobody paid the least attention to her. This Sunday makes up for that one in March, said Susan. I wonder, said Gertrude dreamily, apart to Rilla, if things won't seem rather flat and insipid when peace really comes. After being fed for four years on horrors and fears, terrible reverses, amazing victories, won't anything less be tame and uninteresting? How strange and blessed and dull it will be not to dread the coming of the mail every day. We must dread it for a little while yet, I suppose, said Rilla. Peace won't come, can't come, for some weeks yet, and in those weeks dreadful things may happen. My excitement is over. We have won the victory. But oh, what a price we have paid! Not too high a price for freedom, said Gertrude softly. Do you think it was, Rilla? No, said Rilla under her breath. She was seeing a little white cross on a battlefield of France. No, not if those of us who live will show ourselves worthy of it. If we keep faith. We will keep faith, said Gertrude. She rose suddenly. A silence fell around the table, and in the silence Gertrude repeated Walter's famous poem, The Piper. When she finished, Mr. Meredith stood up and held up his glass. Let us drink, he said, to the silent army. To the boys who followed when the piper summoned, for tomorrow they gave their today. Theirs is the victory. End of chapter thirty three. Chapter thirty four. Mr. Hyde goes to his own place, and Susan takes a honeymoon. Early in November, Jims left Ingleside. Rilla saw him go with many tears, but a heart free from boding. Mrs. Jim Anderson, number two, was such a nice little woman that one was rather inclined to wonder at the luck which bestowed her on Jim. She was rosy-faced and blue-eyed and wholesome, with the roundness and trigness of a geranium leaf. Rilla saw at first glance that she was to be trusted with Jims. "'I'm fond of children, miss,' she said heartily. "'I'm used to them. I've left six little brothers and sisters behind me. Jims is a dear child, and I must say you've done wonders in bringing him up so healthy and handsome. I'll be as good to him as if he was my own, miss. And I'll make Jim toe the line all right. He's a good worker. All he needs is someone to keep him at it and to take charge of his money.' We've rented a little farm just out of the village, and we're going to settle down there. Jim wanted to stay in England, but I says no. I anchored to try a new country, and I've always thought Canada would suit me. I'm so glad you're going to live near us. You'll let Jim's come here often, won't you? I love him dearly. No doubt you do, miss, for a lover blood child I never did see. We understand, Jim and me, what you've done for him, and you won't find us ungrateful. He can come here whenever you want him, and I'll always be glad of any advice from you about his bringing up. He's more your baby than anyone else's, I should say, and I'll see that you get your fair share of him, miss. So Jims went away, with the soup tureen, though not in it. Then the news of the armistice came, and even Glen St. Mary went mad. That night the village had a bonfire and burned the Kaiser in effigy. The fishing village boys turned out and burned all the sand hills off in one grand, glorious conflagration that extended for seven miles. Up at Ingleside, Rilla ran laughing to her room. Now I'm going to do a most unladylike and inexcusable thing, she said as she pulled her green velvet hat out of its box. I am going to kick this hat about the room until it is without form and void, and I shall never, as long as I live, wear anything of that shade of green again. You've certainly kept your vow pluckily, laughed Miss Oliver. It wasn't pluck, it was sheer obstinacy. I'm rather ashamed of it, said Rilla, kicking joyously. I wanted to show mother. It's mean to want to show your own mother. Most unfilial conduct. But I have shown her. And I've shown myself a few things. Oh, Miss Oliver, just for one moment I'm really feeling quite young again, young and frivolous and silly. Did I ever say November was an ugly month? Why, it's the most beautiful month in the whole year. Listen to the bells ringing in Rainbow Valley. I never heard them so clearly. They're ringing for peace and new happiness and all the dear, sweet, sane, homey things that we can have again now, Miss Oliver. Not that I am sane just now, I don't pretend to be. The whole world is having a little crazy spell today. Soon we'll sober down and keep faith and begin to build up our new world. But just for today, let's be mad and glad. 
Susan came in from the outdoor sunlight, looking supremely satisfied. "'Mr. Hyde is gone,' she announced. "'Gone? Do you mean he is dead, Susan?' "'No, Mrs. Dr. dear, that beast is not dead. But you will never see him again, I feel sure of that. Don't be so mysterious, Susan. What has happened to him?' "'Well, Mrs. Dr. dear, he was sitting out on the back steps this afternoon. It was just after the news came that the armistice had been signed, and he was looking his hydest. I can assure you he was an awesome-looking beast. All at once, Mrs. Dr. dear, Bruce Meredith came around the corner of the kitchen, walking on his stilts. He has been learning to walk on them lately, and came over to show me how well he could do it. Hyde just took a look, and one bound carried him over the yard fence. Then he went tearing through the maple grove in great leaps with his ears laid back. You never saw a creature so terrified, Mrs. Dr. dear. He has never returned. Oh, he'll come back, Susan, probably chastened in spirit by his fright. We will see, Mrs. Dr. dear. We will see. Remember, the armistice has been signed. And that reminds me that Whiskers on the Moon had a paralytic stroke last night. I am not saying it is a judgment on him, because I am not in the councils of the Almighty, but one can have one's own thoughts about it. Neither Whiskers on the Moon nor Mr. Hyde will be much more heard of in Glen St. Mary, Mrs. Dr. dear, and that you may tie to. Mr. Hyde certainly was heard of no more. As it could hardly have been his fright that kept him away, the Ingleside folk decided that some dark fate of shot or poison had descended on him, except Susan, who believed and continued to affirm that he had merely gone to his own place. Rilla lamented him, for she had been very fond of her stately golden pussy, and had liked him quite as well in his weird hide moons as in his tame Jekyll ones. "'And now, Mrs. Dr. dear,' said Susan, "'since the fall house-cleaning is over, and the garden truck is all safe in cellar, I am going to take a honeymoon to celebrate the peace.' "'A honeymoon, Susan?' "'Yes, Mrs. Dr. dear, a honeymoon,' repeated Susan firmly. "'I shall never be able to get a husband, but I am not going to be cheated out of everything, and a honeymoon I intend to have. I am going to Charlottetown to visit my married brother and his family. His wife has been ailing all the fall, but nobody knows whether she is going to die or not.' She never did tell any one what she was going to do until she did it. That is the main reason why she was never liked in our family. But to be on the safe side, I feel that I should visit her. I have not been in town for over a day for twenty years, and I have a feeling that I might as well see one of those moving pictures there is so much talk of, so as not to be wholly out of the swim. But have no fear that I shall be carried away with them, Mrs. Dr. dear. I shall be away a fortnight if you can spare me so long. You certainly deserve a good holiday, Susan. Better take a month. That is the proper length for a honeymoon. "'No, Mrs. Dr. dear. A fortnight is all I require. Besides, I must be home for at least three weeks before Christmas to make the proper preparations. We will have a Christmas that is a Christmas this year, Mrs. Dr. dear. Do you think there is any chance of our boys being home for it? No, I think not, Susan. Both Jem and Shirley write that they don't expect to be home before spring. It may be even midsummer before Shirley comes. But Carl Meredith will be home, and Nan and I, and we will have a grand celebration once more.' We'll set chairs for all, Susan, as you did at our first war Christmas. Yes, for all. For my dear lad, whose chair must always be vacant, as well as for the others, Susan. It is not likely I would forget his place, Mrs. Dr. dear, said Susan, wiping her eyes as she departed to pack up for her honeymoon. End of chapter 34 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 35. Rilla, my Rilla. Carl Meredith and Miller Douglas came home just before Christmas, and Glen St. Mary met them at the station with a brass band borrowed from Lowbridge and speeches of home manufacture. Miller was brisk and beaming in spite of his wooden leg. He had developed into a broad-shouldered, imposing-looking fellow, and the D.C. medal he wore reconciled Miss Cornelia to the shortcomings of his pedigree to such a degree that she tacitly recognized his engagement to Mary. The latter put on a few airs, especially when Carter Flagg took Miller into his store as head clerk, but nobody grudged them to her. "'Of course farming's out of the question for us now,' she told Rilla, "'but Miller thinks he'll like storekeeping fine once he gets used to a quiet life again, and Carter Flagg will be a more agreeable boss than old Kitty.' We're going to be married in the fall and live in the old Mead house with the bay windows and the mansard roof. I've always thought that the handsomest house in the Glen, but never did I dream I'd ever live there. We're only renting it, of course, but if things go as we expect and Carter Flagg takes Miller into partnership, we'll own it some day. Say, I've got on some in society, haven't I, considering what I come from? I never aspire to being a storekeeper's wife. But Miller's real ambitious, and he'll have a wife that'll back him up. He says he never saw a French girl worth looking at twice, and that his heart beat true to me every moment he was away. 
Jerry Meredith and Joe Milgrave came back in January, and all winter the boys from the Glen and its environs came home by twos and threes. None of them came back just as they went away, not even those who had been so fortunate as to escape injury. One spring day, when the daffodils were blowing on the Ingleside lawn, and the banks of the brook in Rainbow Valley were sweet with white and purple violets, the little, lazy afternoon accommodation train pulled into the Glen station. It was very seldom that passengers for the Glen came by that train, so nobody was there to meet it except the new station agent and a small black and yellow dog, who for four and a half years had met every train that had steamed into Glen St. Mary. Thousands of trains had Dog Monday met, and never had the boy he waited and watched for returned. Yet still Dog Monday watched Tom with eyes that never quite lost hope. Perhaps his dog heart failed him at times. He was growing old and rheumatic. When he walked back to his kennel after each train had gone, his gait was very sober now. He never trotted, but went slowly with a drooping head and a depressed tail that had quite lost its old saucy uplift. One passenger stepped off the train, a tall fellow in a faded lieutenant's uniform, who walked with a barely perceptible limp. He had a bronzed face, and there were some gray hairs in the ruddy curls that clustered around his forehead. The new station agent looked at him anxiously. He was used to seeing the khaki-clad figures come off the train, some met by a tumultuous crowd, others, who had sent no word of their coming, stepping off quietly like this one. But there was a certain distinction of bearing and features in this soldier that caught his attention, and made him wonder a little more interestedly who he was. A black and yellow streak shot past the station agent. Dog Monday stiff? Dog Monday rheumatic? Dog Monday old? Never believe it. Dog Monday was a young pup, gone clean mad with rejuvenating joy. He flung himself against the tall soldier with a bark that choked in his throat from sheer rapture. He flung himself on the ground and writhed in a frenzy of welcome. He tried to climb the soldier's khaki legs and slipped down and groveled in an ecstasy that seemed as if it must tear his little body in pieces. He licked his boots and when the lieutenant had, with laughter on his lips and tears in his eyes, succeeded in gathering the little creature up in his arms, Dog Monday laid his head on the khaki shoulder and licked the sunburned neck making queer sounds between barks and sobs. The station agent had heard the story of Dog Monday. He knew now who the returned soldier was. Dog Monday's long vigil was ended. Jem Blythe had come home. "'We are all very happy and sad and thankful,' wrote Rilla in her diary a week later, though Susan has not yet recovered—never will recover, I believe—from the shock of having Jem come home the very night she had, owing to a strenuous day, prepared a pick-up supper. I shall never forget the sight of her, tearing madly about from pantry to cellar, hunting out stored-away goodies. Just as if anybody cared what was on the table, none of us could eat anyway. It was meat and drink just to look at Jem. Mother seemed afraid to take her eyes off him, lest he vanish out of her sight. It is wonderful to have Jem back, and little dog Monday. Monday refuses to be separated from Jem for a moment. He sleeps on the foot of his bed and squats beside him at mealtimes and on Sunday he went to church with him and insisted on going right into our pew, where he went to sleep on Jem's feet. In the middle of the sermon he woke up and seemed to think he must welcome Jem all over again, for he bounded up with a series of barks and wouldn't quiet down until Jem took him up in his arms. But nobody seemed to mind, and Mr. Meredith came and patted his head after the service and said, "'Faith and affection and loyalty are precious things wherever they are found. That little dog's love is a treasure, Jem.' One night, when Jem and I were talking things over in Rainbow Valley, I asked him if he had ever felt afraid at the front. Jem laughed. <laughs> afraid? I was afraid scores of times, sick with fear. I, who used to laugh at Walter when he was frightened. Do you know, Walter was never frightened after he got to the front. Realities never scared him. Only his imagination could do that. His colonel told me that Walter was the bravest man in the regiment. Brilla, I never realized that Walter was dead until I came back home. You don't know how I miss him now. You folks here have got used to it, in a sense, but it's all fresh to me. Walter and I grew up together. We were chums as well as brothers. And now, here, in this old valley we loved when we were children, it has come home to me that I'm not going to see him again. Jem is going back to college in the fall, and so are Jerry and Carl. I suppose Shirley will, too. He expects to be home in July. Di and Nan will go on teaching. Faith doesn't expect to be home before September. I suppose she will teach then, too, for she and Jem can't be married until he gets through his course in medicine. Una Meredith has decided, I think, to take a course in household science at Kingsport, and Gertrude is to be married to her major, and is frankly happy about it. Shamelessly happy, she says, but I think her attitude is very beautiful. They are all talking of their plans and hopes, more soberly than they used to do long ago, but still with interest and a determination to carry on and make good in spite of lost years. 
"'We're in a new world,' Jem says, "'and we've got to make it a better one than the old. "'That isn't done yet, though some folks seem to think it ought to be. "'The job isn't finished. "'It isn't really begun. "'The old world is destroyed, and we must build up the new one. "'It will be the task of years. "'I've seen enough of war to realize that we've got to make a world where wars can't happen. "'We've given Prussianism its mortal wound, "'but it isn't dead yet, and it isn't confined to Germany either. "'It isn't enough to drive out the old spirit. "'We've got to bring in the new.' I'm writing down those words of Jem's in my diary so that I can read them over occasionally and get courage from them when moods come when I find it not so easy to keep faith. Rilla closed her journal with a little sigh. Just then she was not finding it easy to keep faith. All the rest seemed to have some special aim or ambition about which to build up their lives. She had none. And she was very lonely, horribly lonely. Jem had come back, but he was not the laughing boy brother who had gone away in 1914 and he belonged to Faith. Walter would never come back. She had not even Jim's left. All at once her world seemed wide and empty. That is, it had seemed wide and empty from the moment yesterday when she had read in a Montreal paper a fortnight-old list of returned soldiers, in which was the name of Captain Kenneth Ford. So Ken was home, and he had not even written her that he was coming. He had been in Canada two weeks, and she had not had a line from him. Of course he had forgotten, if there was ever anything to forget. A hand-clasp, a kiss, a look, a promise asked under the influence of a passing emotion. It was all absurd. She had been a silly, romantic, inexperienced goose. Well, she would be wiser in the future. Very wise, and very discreet, and very contemptuous of men and their ways. I suppose I'd better go with Una and take up household science, too, she thought, as she stood by her window, and looked down through a delicate emerald tangle of young vines on Rainbow Valley, lying in a wonderful lilac light of sunset. There did not seem anything very attractive just then about household science, but with a whole new world waiting to be built, a girl must do something. The doorbell rang. Rilla turned reluctantly stairwards. She must answer it. There was no one else in the house but she hated the idea of callers just then. She went downstairs slowly and opened the front door. A man in khaki was standing on the steps. A tall fellow, with dark eyes and hair, and a narrow white scar running across his brown cheek. Rilla stared at him foolishly for a moment. Who was it? She ought to know him. There was certainly something very familiar about him. Rilla, my Rilla, he said. Ken! gasped Rilla. Of course it was Ken. But he looked so much older. He was so much changed. That scar. The lines about his eyes and lips. Her thoughts went whirling helplessly. Ken took the uncertain hand she held out and looked at her. The slim Rilla of four years ago had rounded out into symmetry. He had left a schoolgirl, and he found a woman. A woman with wonderful eyes and a dented lip, and rose-bloom cheek. A woman altogether beautiful and desirable. The woman of his dreams. "'Is it Rilla, my Rilla?' he asked, meaningly. Emotion shook Rilla from head to foot. Joy, happiness, sorrow, fear, every passion that had wrung her heart in those four long years seemed to surge up in her soul for a moment as the deeps of being were stirred. She had tried to speak. At first her voice would not come. Then— "'Yes,' said Rilla. End of chapter 35 End of Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery.